हेलो एवरीबॉडी वेलकम टू दीक्षा ऑनलाइन एंड वेलकम टू नीट क्रैश कोर्स सो टुडे वी विल बी डिस्कसिंग इन दिस पर्टिकुलर लेक्चर विल बी डिस्कसिंग टू चैप्टर्स वन इज डाइवर्सिटी इन द लिविंग वर्ल्ड एंड बायोलॉजिकल क्लासिफिकेशन सो व्हाट एग्जैक्टली डज डाइवर्सिटी मीन सो वी मीन दैट इट मीन्स दैट द लिविंग वर्ल्ड इज मेड अप ऑफ a diverse group of organisms in their form function and structure you know about the variety of animals and plants and microorganisms living on this planet and that constitutes the biodiversity or the living world what are some of the characteristics of living organisms now one of the most defining characteristics of living organisms is cellular organization <clears throat> and then you have growth how is growth uh, different in living and non living organisms in living organisms growth is from the inside plants show indeterminate growth and animals show determinate growth homeostasis refers to maintenance of constant internal environment and then another defining not exactly a defining but one of the characteristics of living organisms is reproduction i i i said it is not a defining character because there are organisms which are sterile which do not reproduce but just because they don't reproduce you don't call them non living so it is not a defining character but yes it is one of the main characters of living organisms okay then we have metabolism yes metabolism is a defining character of living organism however a metabolic reaction is not because you may carry out a metabolic reaction in a in a test tube as well but metabolism within a cellular architecture is something which is a defining character of life and then you have response to stimuli response to stimuli is again a defining characteristic of life and then you would like to add it it would be nice to add consciousness also as a defining character of life and uh, especially when it comes to human beings we are also self conscious isn't it we are also self aware so these are some of the important characteristics of living organisms that you must remember so what is biodiversity the number the enormous number and variety of organisms that are existing on this planet is referred to as biodiversity and then when you talk about how to deal with this enormous diversity if you wish to study this enormous diversity then you have to streamline your studying process and there is a process that you need to carry on and this process that is referred to as taxonomy now the principles and processes which are associated with taxonomy include first of all you need to identify the organism then you need to classify the organism and then you need to name it identify means you need to attribute certain features to the animal for example you encounter an animal and you identify it as an insect because you see that it has head thorax and abdomen it has legs six legs or three pairs of legs so you have identified it by giving it certain features and then you need to know where to place this animal and where in which group to place it depending on the similarities and dissimilarities that it shares with the other organisms and finally you have to name it so this naming the process of naming is referred to as nomenclature and nomenclature is done in case of plants by scientific bodies like icbn in plants and iczn in case of animals So this binomial nomenclature was established by father of taxonomy Carolus Linnaeus and he was the one who gave two names that is the genus name and the specific name and that's why it is referred to as the binomial nomenclature and you can see how even the name of the author who gave or who first described this organism is also affixed to the scientific name of the organism So what are some of the rules of binomial nomenclature like we saw you give it two names one is called the generic name and one is called the specific name both the names need to be latinized the genus name must start with a capital letter and the species name must start with a small letter if you are handwriting it it should be underlined and if it is printed it should be in italics and like we said the name of the author in abbreviated form must be affixed to the scientific name so the genus name the specific name and the author's 
uh, name in abbreviated form is referred to as the binomial epithet okay now why should we classify organisms we should classify organisms because there are so many organisms on this planet to make our study more systematic we need to classify them on what basis do we classify them we classify them on the basis of observable characteristics and here i would like to introduce you to a word that is referred to as the taxon for example if i take an example like kingdom animalia now when i say kingdom animalia here the word kingdom represents a rank or a category so this is called a category or a rank it is an abstract term but the kingdom includes a group of real organisms that group of real organisms are animals and such a group of real organisms are referred to as taxon did you understand so i have assigned a category or rank of a kingdom to this taxon which includes animals for example another example if i were to give you say for example class mammalia now once again mammalia is a taxon because it is a group of real organisms it includes mammals and class is the category or rank on what basis do i assign the category or rank and what are the different levels or what are the hierarchies of category and rank you can see the hierarchy here starting from the highest to the lowest this is referred to as the category hierarchy or the linear hierarchy isn't it so kingdom phylum class order family genus and species you we always start with the lowest category or rank the lowest category or rank or the smallest category or rank is the species and the highest category or rank and the largest category or rank is the kingdom so what you do here is it is basically you are pulling it up as you go up the ladder now imagine that you have 10 species okay now just for example i'm giving you now imagine that all the 10 species share some similarities so you decide to place all these 10 species into the same genus then imagine there are different genera and they share some similarity among them because there are different genera sharing similarity you place those genera which share some similarity into the same family different families which are similar are placed into the same order different orders which are similar are placed into the same class and so on and so forth did you understand so basically a category or rank is an abstract term it only determines the position of a particular taxon in the linnean hierarchy and a taxon is a group of living organisms and act a group of real organisms is that clear so basically like i mentioned taxonomy deals with identification classification and nomenclature so first you need to identify them then you need to place it in a particular class based on its observable characters and finally you need to give it a name that is called nomenclature sometimes in taxonomy we are not just bothered about classifying them and naming them but we also take into consideration evolutionary relationships when we take into consideration evolutionary relationships as well as comparative features then we refer to this branch or this particular process as systematics the word is derived from systema which means systematic arrangement and linnaeus published a book called systema naturae isn't it now he published a book called systema naturae in which he had specifically dealt with the taxonomy of animals now like i told you we have different ranks or we have different categories and the ranks or categories are depending on complexity depending on similarities depending on differences and i told you you start with the lowest rank or category that is species and you go to the highest rank or category that is kingdom now to give you a very simple example say for example in your own college you have categories and ranks isn't it now for example you have section and above section you have class and above class you have standard and above that you have college now for example you belong to neat section sorry say for example you belong to section a there are many sections section a b c 
B, etc. And you belong to neat sec neat class. Along with neat class, there is JE class also. You belong to twelfth standard. Along with that, there is eleventh standard also. And we all belong to Diksha. The name of the institution is Diksha. So what have you done here? You have assigned different ranks. Which is the lowest rank here? Section is the lowest rank. Isn't it? Because you are being more specific when you are talking about the section. A section includes a less number of individuals. Isn't it? Now if I take section A, it may include only 30 people in it. But a class includes many many sections and on what basis have I put for example section A and section B on what basis have I put them in neat section or neat class based on their similarity. On what basis have I put neat and JE for example some people from neat and JE into 12th standard because they are similar in the sense that they depend on the 12th standard PU syllabus. And then on what basis have I put 12th and 11th standard in the same college because yes we belong to the same institution something that binds us together is that we are a fraternity of the same institution so as you climb up the ladder what are you doing you are collecting things based upon you are pooling things based upon similarities you started with the lowest section which is referred to as the lowest rank or category which is referred to as the section you ended up with the highest category or rank which is college and what did you do all along you pooled the things all along or groups all along based on what similarities and what dissimilarities they share with each other the same thing is done in the case of taxonomic hierarchy okay and like i said species is the lowest category or rank and kingdom is the highest category or rank what is a species exactly? A species can be defined as a group of individual organisms which are capable of interbreeding meaning reproducing with each other and producing a fertile offspring. For example, there are three examples given over here, Mangifera indica, indica is the species, Solanum tuberosum potato, tuberosum is the species, Panthera leo, lion, leo is the species. So as you know, the second name is the species epithet or the species name or the specific name and it always starts with a small letter. So this is the taxonomic hierarchy. We start with the species, the lowest rung in the ladder and the kingdom which is the highest rung in the ladder. Okay. Now what if you have many many species which are related to each other? Like if I have many many sections, I am going to put them in the same class. I have section A and section B, I told you. I have section A, section B. All the students who are in section A and all the students who are in section B are aspiring to become doctors, so like you all. So I am going to put them in the same class that is neat. Similarly, I have two species now, species 1 and species 2. Now because they are related, I am going to put them in the same genus. So on what basis did I put them in the same genus? Because the species are related. For example, I can space, I can place tuberosum species of Solanum genus and Melongena species. I am going to put them in the same genus which is referred to as the Solanum. So that's why the scientific name of potato is Solanum tuberosum and Solanum melongena. So tuberosum and melongena are included under the same genus Solanum. Similarly, species such as Leo, Tigris and Pardus, that is lion, tiger and leopard, all of them belong to the same genus which is referred to as Panthera because of the similarities that they share with each other. Okay, please note the errors here it should be in small letters okay and it should be underlined and here otherwise it should be italicized okay now what if i have many many related gene gene uh, genera with me i'm going to take all the related genera and put them into the same family so a family is a group of related genera 
isn't it? For example, I have a genus called Solanum with me. Then I have two additional genera called Petunia and Datura with me. I notice that Solanum, the plants belonging to genus Solanum, plants belonging to genus Petunia and Datura, they share some similarity. So I put them in a family that is referred to as family Solanaceae. So one family includes many like genera. Similarly, the family Felidae includes two like genera that is Panthera and Felis. Did you understand? So family is a group of related genera. Now what if you have related families? You take all the related families and you put them in the same order. For example, I have family fem Felidae with me, the cat family and the dog family. Now because they are related, I am going to place both of them in the same family I mean in the same order that is called carnivora. In the same way in plants also there is family Solanaceae, family Convolvulaceae and scientists have noticed that they have some similarities in their floral structures. So they put these two families together in the order which is referred to as polymoniales. Class, I can put similar orders into the same class. For example, in the previous uh, Slide, I told you there was a plant order called polymoniales. Isn't it? Now, I can put this plant order along with a plant order called sapindales, which has mango in it. Polymoniales includes convolvulaceae and solanaceae, and sapindales includes the mango plant. It is the order to which the mango plant belongs. Now, I see that both these orders, remember that this these belong to a rank called order because they share similarities between them i am going to pick them both up i am going to say that they are similar so let me put them in the same class and i'm going to put them to a class that is referred to as the dicotyledony did you understand so similar orders are put together to belong to the same class all right so order carnivora in animals, order carnivora and order primata are put under the same class that is mammalia again based on their similarities. And then related classes which have similarities are put under the same phylum. In plants we don't use the word phylum, we use the word uh, division. For example, we saw that there was order. Which order was it? Uh, uh, mono uh, dicotyledonae, isn't it? Class. So let me take dicotyledonae here. For example, there is an order called dicotyledonae, and uh, sorry, there is a class called dicotyledonae, and there is another class called monocotyledonae. Now I see there are some similarities in them. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to place these two classes together in the same division. The example is I know that they are flowering plants. So I put them under angiospermae. So if I see any similarities in two different classes, I'm going to pool those classes together and I'm going to put them in the same division. So again, it's basically what I'm doing is as I'm climbing up the ladder, I'm pooling the uh, entities together and as a result it is cumulative as I climb the ladder okay kingdom is the highest category or rank and one important thing you should remember is it is the largest and the highest category for example kingdom plantae includes all the plants and animalia includes all the animals and one important thing is as you climb up the ladder the common characters go on decreasing isn't it now for example you started with what you started with section and then you moved on to class then standard then college so where, which is more specific? I told you more specific is section. Isn't it? So obviously you would share more similarity with your person, with another student in the same section, rather than sharing the most similarity with another student in the same college. You are more closely related to your classmate sitting next to you in the same section than somebody else who is walking in the corridor in your college. So when we talk about section, the lowest rank, there is greatest similarity. When we talk about college, 
there is least similarity similarly when we talk about species it is highly specific when we talk about the highest rank which is kingdom it is least specific so as we go up what happens we go on from more specific to less specific or we go on from less general to so we are moving on up the ladder we go from less general to more general or more specific to less specific did you understand some of the taxonomic aids which will help you in the science of taxonomy are herbarium botanical gardens museums zoological parks and key now museums where you have preserved animal and plant specimens okay and the preservative for example you are conserving them you are preserving them in containers or jars in formaldehyde you may also preserve dry specimens or stuffed specimens when it comes to animals herbarium you know you take the plant specimen you collect the plant specimen it is dried well it is treated sometimes it is treated with fungicides so that it doesn't get contaminated with fungi and it is pressed and preserved and on the sheet you need to give a lot of information about the date and place of collection and the local or the vernacular and the english and the botanical or the scientific names who collected it the date of collection etc botanical gardens is uh, an example of ex situ conservation you can bring plants from different parts of the world and conserve them at the same place now please all of you must learn some of the examples and location of some of the major botanical gardens which you can expect in your competitive exams zoological park is similar to a botanical garden but it is animals here we are concerned about it is also an ex situ conservation because you are conserving animals not in their natural habitat but you are simulating the natural environment and then we have a key a key is consisting of a paired word now for example let me take a very simple example uh say in plants you have something called arrangement of leaves called phyllotaxy now you have leaves which are arranged in alternate pattern like this on the stem one per node or you have leaves which are arranged two per node facing each other opposite to each other like this so you can say that this condition is called the alternate phyllotaxy or this is referred to as opposite phyllotaxy okay so alternate and opposite phyllotaxy now notice i have created a key because i have used two words over here that is one is opposing the other alternate phyllotaxy is different from opposite phyllotaxy isn't it so now this forms a pair and this becomes a couplet now suppose you have a plant in your hand and you want to check this particular key now suppose you have say a plant which has alternate phyllotaxy then which one will you omit in this pair you will omit opposite phyllotaxy because okay this doesn't suit me because i don't have a plant which has opposite phyllotaxy but i have a plant which has alternate phyllotaxy so you will select this option and whichever option in this pair or couplet whichever choice you make that becomes a lead because that will lead you on to further identification as in alternate phyllotaxy will lead you to other characteristics of the plant uh, which are specific to that plant which may help you in identifying that plant so a very simple key just to make the uh, concept clear to you that is alternate or opposite alternate or opposite phyllotaxy i would choose one of them i would eliminate the other once i choose one of them i would go with it and that becomes my lead because that will lead me to many other characteristics which will ultimately help me to identify the species of plant that i have with me in my hand all right then you have many other taxonomic aids like for example flora in flora we talk about habitat and what is called as distribution of plants uh, in a particular area like for example flora of karnataka now in flora of karnataka you have uh, what all types of plants where do they uh, live and how is their distribution on the land of karnataka is basically spoken of along with flora you also have something called a manual and you have something called a monograph a manual has information about all the species of plants in a particular area 
okay so if you want to know what are all the species of plants in a particular area not just plants it may be species of organisms in a particular area you would opt for a uh, a resource in taxonomy that is called flora then what is monograph a monograph means it has information about a single taxon a taxon like i said is a real group of organisms for example there is information if i have a book with me and i have information about all mammals in it so mammals is a taxon because it is a group of real organisms so then such a book which has information about a particular taxon is called a manual a book which has information about all the species in an area is a ma sorry information about a particular taxon is a monograph information about all the species in an area is a manual information about habitat and distribution of plants in a particular area is nothing but flora so these are some of the taxonomic uh, aids which you must know about So now let us move on to the next chapter that is biological classification. Aristotle was the one who first gave a very very simple classification entirely based on observable characteristics. He classified plants into trees, shrubs and herbs. He classified animals into inaima. The spelling is wrong over here. Inaima are those animals which according to him he put all the animals having red blood in inaima and all the animals which had white blood or sorry without red blood or colorless blood then he put them in anaima this is a very vague form of classification because you are not taking into account anything but the external appearance linnaeus contributed to classification because linnaeus was the one who proposed the two kingdom classification that is kingdom plantae and kingdom animalia but he ignored a lot of things he did not consider cellular architecture he did not consider the cellular organization he did not consider the mode of nutrition that is whether the plants were autotrophic or hetero uh, or the organism was autotrophic or heterotrophic okay then therefore today we don't follow aristotle's or linnaeus's theory even Ernst Haeckel's uh, three kingdom classification where for the first time he included a group which includes unicellular eukaryotes under something called kingdom protista. So you can see how the hierarchy is. Aristotle just classified vaguely based on external morphology or observable characters. Linnaeus gave the two kingdom classification. Ernst Haeckel gave the three kingdom classification and he included the kingdom that is called protista. Now you have to remember what are the drawbacks of the Linnaean classification. What are some of the features he did not take into consideration. Okay. Copeland introduced kingdom monera which includes all prokaryotes in it and what we follow is R.H. Whittaker's five kingdom classification in and he introduced it including all the important aspects like he took into cellular architecture, the cellular organization or body organization, the mode of nutrition and how the organism survives in the ecosystem and also he took into consideration the evolutionary relationships between organisms. And then we have another widely accepted system today which was introduced by Carl Wies and Carl Wies introduced the domain classification. He included three domains, archaea, the most primitive forms of bacteria and eubacteria, the modern forms and or the evolved forms and eukarya which includes all the eukaryotes. So archaea and eubacteria together include prokaryotes whereas eukarya includes the cells, the true cells or eukaryotes. Viruses. So Pasteur was not the one who coined the term virus. It was D.J. Ivanovsky. D.J. Ivanovsky was the one who used the word virus for the first time. And in 1892, he was working on and he recognized a particular virus, which was the causative of the mosaic disease in tobacco, which is referred to as the tobacco mosaic virus. So this modification has been done in the newer editions of the textbook. It was not Pasteur who coined the term virus. It was D.J. Ivanovsky. And M. W. Bejerink in 1898 called viruses as a contagious venomous fluid that is contagium vivum fluidum because he collected extract from infected tobacco mosaic plants and he saw that it could 
produce the disease on healthy plants and then in 1935 it was w m stanley who showed that viruses have a particulate nature and they can be crystallized another breakthrough in the field of virology okay so you should remember some of the contributions of some of the scientists in the field of virology characteristics you know that viruses are considered to be the connecting links between living and non living isn't it so they are obligate parasites they cannot live outside the host cell they do not have a cellular organization outside the host they are just like a particle the inert and crystalline and viruses basically have biomolecules in them that's why scientists are torn between calling them living or non living because they do have biomolecules they do have organic substances like proteins and genetic genetic material such as dna and rna they have a dna or rna in their central core which forms the core of the virus particles and uh, of course most of these viruses which infect plants have single stranded rna animal viruses may either have single or double stranded rna or dna whereas we have special bacteriophages so basically plant viruses are called phytophages animal viruses are called zoophages and bacterial viruses which attack bacterial cells are called bacteriophages they have double stranded dna as their genetic material now you can see the structure of tobacco mosaic virus which was discovered by dj ivanovsky in 1892 he found the causative of the tobacco mosaic disease it has basically a cylindrical structure here okay you can see how the structure looks like and it has a coiled single stranded rna inside which is its genetic material this single stranded rna has about 6400 nucleotides in it and you can see a protein covering which is referred to as the capsid and each individual component or subunit in the protein covering is referred to as a capsomer and there are totally how many such capsomeres there are 2130 capsomeres which are present in this particular case okay now they have uh, the length of this particular virus particle is about 1000 angstroms and it has a diameter of 180 angstroms so this is the structure of so you need to remember they have a, a spherical or not sorry not spherical a spiral single stranded rna structure which measures about 6400 nucleotides and they have a protein coat which is made up of 2130 capsomeres length is 1000 angstroms diameter is 180 angstroms and uh, uh, their rna has 6400 nucleotides okay now what is a bacteriophage look like now a bacteriophage has a polyhedral head and then it has a collar and then the tail has a tube a core which is a tube like structure but around the tail there is a sheath there is a proteinaceous sheath around the tail and you can see how this core in the tail is connected to the head with the help of this collar this tube is the core of the tail all right and this outer covering is referred to as the sheath and this entire structure is the tail inside the polyhedral structure you have the double stranded dna at the base of the tail there is a hexagonal or a polygonal basal plate like this the lower surface of the basal plate has tail pins there are six tail pins which help it to land on the bacteria and then from the angles of the basal plate you have these tail fibers which emerge okay so this gives you a idea of what is the structure of the bacteriophage so basically there is a head there is a collar there is a tail which is covered with a sheath and this is referred to as the basal disc or the tail plate and these are the pins the tail pins or the pegs and then these are the tail fibers okay so this is how a bacteriophage looks like and then you have viruses which also cause a lot of deadly diseases in humans and you also know the currently ongoing corona virus that is also a virus as you are aware in plants they cause mosaic disease 
then mostly in plants there are they have symptoms like refloating and curling and yellowing and dwarfing and basically the growth is uh, retarded and this is called stunted growth okay T.O. Diener in the year 1971 was the one who discovered a very very unique uh, pathogenic uh, entity which he called as viroids. Surprisingly the viroids are very similar to virus but they only have free RNA. They have a circular single stranded RNA but what is missing in them? They don't have a protein coat. Do you understand what I am saying? Protein coat is missing. Only the nucleic acid is present. And the nucleic acid has about a length of 250 to 370 nucleotides. It is single-stranded circular RNA. It causes diseases such as potato spindle tuber viroid. There is a viroid called PSTV. It causes a disease called potato spindle tuber. Then there are other viroids also which cause diseases in plants such as there is the chrysanthemum stunt. Then there is citrus exocortis. Yes or no? So these are some of the examples. PSTV, chrysanthemum stunt and citrus exocortis. They basically affect plants. Now recently uh, it's in, included in your textbook and other infectious particles which are referred to as prions. Now the discoverer of prions that is Stanley Prusner. Now he was awarded Nobel Prize in the year 1997. Basically prions are nothing but abnormally folded proteins. It is surprising that proteins can cause disease. Isn't it? So here we saw it was only, viroids were only RNA. Now we are saying that these are only prions are only proteins. These are abnormally folded proteins and uh, Stanley Prusner discovered them and for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize. The most famous disease, the most well reported disease which is caused by prions is in case of cattle. It is called the mad cow disease. It is also called the bovine spongy form encephalopathy, which is BSE, and a related disease in humans. It is called CJD, which is Creutzfeldt. Jacob. So please take down all these points. It will help you to go through when you are preparing for your NEET exam. So prions are also included here. They are infectious proteinaceous particles. Abnormally folded infectious proteins that have the ability to cause disease. Prions cause mad cow disease or bovine spongiform encephalopathy. In humans they cause something called Creutzfeldt jacob disease. Isn't it? And uh, they also are known to cause another disease in tribal humans which is called the Kuru disease. K-U-R-U. -U. Alright? And there is one more disease they cause in sheep. It is called the Scrapey disease. So these are some of the diseases. In humans they cause CJD, Creutzfeldt jacob disease or Kuru disease and in sheep they cause scrapy, in cattle they cause bovine spongiform encephalopathy or mad cow disease. So it is very surprising that nucleic acids alone can cause diseases such as viroids and proteins alone which are abnormally folded are capable of causing diseases. Kingdom Monera includes Archibacteria and Eubacteria and includes the modern photosynthetic bacteria which contain chlorophyll A in them that is Cyanobacteria. Archibacteria are the most primitive bacteria. They have special non-cellulosic polysaccharides and proteins and they have lipid layers which help in a very thick lipid layer in their cell membrane which helps them to overcome or withstand stresses of high temperature and other extremes of conditions. 
we have methanogens which are basically the type of archaebacteria methanogens have the ability to convert carbon dioxide methanol and formic acid into methane that's why they are called methanogens and methanogens are chemo synthetic later you will understand what is chemosynthetic now just remember that they derive energy where do they get energy they get energy by oxidizing chemicals okay now these are methane producers they are anaerobic they are obligate anaerobic and they are mostly found in marshy areas and you know the use of them you can use them in biogas plants they are used in production of biogas and methanogens are very commonly found in the stomach of cattle in the rumen of cattle and their job is to convert carbon dioxide methanol and formic acid into methane and they are chemosynthetic in the sense that they can derive energy in the form of atp and how do they obtain this atp by oxidizing chemicals which are present at their disposal okay examples is methanococcus and methanobacterium halophiles are salt loving organisms these are salt loving bacteria these are referred to as halophiles they need a very very high salt concentration in order to survive they are anaerobes all right now these halophiles basically cannot manufacture their own food so they are heterotrophic they are not autotrophic they are they depend on outside food source and whenever the sunlight becomes very very intense so whenever the sunlight becomes very very intense they start producing a purple colored pigment which is referred to as bacteriorhodopsin which is very very related to the pigment present in our ro rods in our retina so this is when the sunlight is very very intense it is said that using this sunlight and using this pigment that is bacteriorhodopsin they are capable of generating atp but however they cannot use this atp in order to fix the atmospheric carbon dioxide that's why they cannot manufacture their own food and hence they are referred to as heterotrophic did you understand so they have chemicals to synthesize atp in the presence of light but they cannot use this atp in order to fix the atmospheric carbon dioxide or in other words they cannot use this atp in order to manufacture food that's why they are not autotrophic they are heterotrophic example is halococcus and halobacterium thermoacidophiles are again autotrophic they are chemosynthetic they can obtain energy from oxidizing substances they are mostly found they love very very high temperatures and very low ph say for example ph of 2 and what they do is they basically oxidize sulfur into sulfuric acid under aerobic conditions that's why the sulfuric acid is what increases the acidity in their surrounding environment and they are found in sulfur springs they are found around volcanoes and they are found in thermal vents example is thermoproteus and you can take down another example that is thermoplasma now moving on to u bacteria now u bacteria are the ones which are the modern or evolved or the true bacteria you know that they have a genetic material in the form of double stranded dna which is the nucleoid and they store food in the form of glycogen they have invaginations of the plasma membrane that is referred to as mesosomes now the shapes of bacteria you can see here if they are rod like they are bacilli spherical they are cocci if they are comma shaped as in cholera causing bacteria they are vibrio and if they are spiral it's referred to as spirillum mode of nutrition there are bacteria which can synthesize food they can make their own food how do they make their own food by capturing carbon from atmospheric carbon dioxide now whichever organism can capture carbon from atmospheric carbon dioxide we call such organism as autotrophic bacteria now photosynthetic bacteria are those bacteria which contain photosynthetic pigments in them now what are some of the pigments that they contain they may contain a type of pigment called bacteriopurpurin 
which is nothing but bacterial chlorophyll and they may have pigments such as bacteriovirin so bacteriopurpurin and bacteriovirin are some of the pigments which you can expect in photosynthetic bacteria the only difference in photosynthetic bacteria is they do not liberate oxygen so we call this type of photosynthesis as an oxygenic now why do plants liberate oxygen plants liberate oxygen because they split now these plants have the ability to split water into obtain to obtain protons electrons and oxygen but these bacteria do not use water they use sulfur they use hydrogen sulfide so obviously when they use sulfur and hydrogen sulfide and they use other organic compounds not water but so when they are not splitting water you cannot ex expect oxygen as a byproduct so such a photosynthesis which is seen in bacteria where oxygen is not a byproduct it is referred to as an oxygenic photosynthesis all right some of the examples for photosynthetic bacteria you can include you have the purple sulfur bacteria you have the green sulfur bacteria you have the purple non sulfur bacteria you have the green non sulfur bacteria okay so these are some of the examples which you may look up to and you have to learn some more examples under each of these categories for example if you take purple sulfur bacteria the example will be thiospirillum and chromatium and for green sulfur there is chlorobium for green for purple non sulfur we have rhodospirillum and for green non sulfur we have chloronema so only a few examples i'm giving you here now moving on to cyanobacteria cyanobacteria include nostoc and anabena okay now these are bacteria which are very unique because they are capable of photosynthesizing that means they have thylakoid membranes in their cytoplasm they are found in freshwater bodies the unicellular i think you remember there are cells which are arranged in a beaded structure like this correct and they have a thick covering of mucilage on them now each cell in this particular colony we call this entire thread like structure as a trichome now if you look at each cell in the cell you will have a central zone called centroplasm where there is a nucleus and a peripheral cytoplasm or the chromoplasm where you have the these membrane bound structures these vesicles sorry these sac like structures flattened disc like structures which are referred to as thylakoids a very important feature is within these thylakoids you have chlorophyll a and you have pigments which are referred to as phycobilins phycobilins are of three types what are the three types of phycobilins red colored blue colored and light blue colored pigments okay so peripheral chromoplasm and central centroplasm and there are special cells in them i'm highlighting this one cell such cells in the colony or the trichome are referred to as heterocysts now what do these cells do these are the cells which help in nitrogen fixation they contain an enzyme called nitrogenase and they are very very thick walled so that oxygen doesn't enter inside nitrogenase cannot function in the presence of oxygen and these heterocysts heterocysts are also sites where the trichome can break apart and therefore they may also help in fragmentation they undergo oxygenic photosynthesis that means they use water they split water in order to obtain protons and electrons and there is liberation of oxygen then you have bacteria which have the ability now we saw that they were photosynthetic bacteria in photosynthetic bacteria the bacteria obtain energy from the sun 
they use sun energy to get to make atp but there are some bacteria which can make atp by using energy from oxidation of certain inorganic substances like nitrates oxidization of ammonia nitrites etc these include nitrifying bacteria and what do we call all these bacteria which cannot obtain energy from the sun which obtain energy or atp in order to manufacture food by oxidizing inorganic substances we call them as chemoautotrophic or chemosynthetic so basically they oxidize substances they obtain atp the energy and what do they do to this energy they use this energy in order to make food did you understand then there are also heterotrophic bacteria which cannot make their own food and therefore they depend on external sources parasitic bacteria which live on the host examples of heterotrophic bacteria saprophytic bacteria which feed on dead and decaying organic matter like decomposing bacteria symbiotic bacteria like the root nodules of plants have leguminous roots have uh, these uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria which are nothing but symbiotic bacteria reproduce by very simple fission where one cell splits into two as you can see and sometimes this endospore formation is not really a mode of reproduction it is only a kind of uh, an attempt that is made by the bacteria to overcome unfavorable conditions okay during binary fission what happens is there is a cell now for example this is the bacterial cell it has its genetic material the genetic material is kept attached to the cell membrane with the help of an infolding called mesosome so what happens is the dna also undergoes duplication the mesosome also doubles the mesosomes start moving away from each other and a partition is formed between the two and this becomes one daughter cell and this becomes one daughter cell so this is the mechanism of binary fission and what makes the endospore overcome heat overcome desiccation that is complete absence of water and they are also resistant to chemical stressors like acids and alkali that's because this endospore that we were talking about which is not really a mode of reproduction but it is only meant to overcome unfavorable condition it is called a perinating structure in the wall of this endospore there is a chemical called calcium dipicolinic acid so it is called c dp calcium dipicolinic acid and this is what provides it with the resistance it can resist heat it can resist now for example if there are bacteria which have endospore in the milk even if you pasteurize milk even if you boil the milk or raise the temperature to 100 degrees nothing happens to these endospores they are heat resistant they are resistant to dehydration they are resistant to chemicals toxic chemicals that's because the wall of this endospore like i told you if this is the bacteria all the contents of the bacteria including the dna the genetic material will get pulled towards one region and there a rounded structure will be formed and this rounded structure with a core nucleus and a core cytoplasm in it with a very very thick wall the wall is basically three layered and this is referred to as the endospore and in the wall there is a special substance called calcium dipicolinic acid which offers resistance to temperature and resistance to uh, desiccation and toxic chemicals okay importance of bacteria saprophytic bacteria which act as scavengers they used in fermentation in curdling of milk rhizobium acts as a nitrogen fixer there are bacteria that cause diseases which affect our agricultural produce they used in retting of fibers now you obtain fibers from plants like phloem fibers and xylem fibers once you extract the fibers if you treat them with bacteria the bacteria eat up all the cellular components and what is left is nothing but the cell wall component which is very very slow in biodegradation which is called the fibers they are used in product of antibiotics and they are also used in mineral extraction mycoplasma are nothing but wall-less bacteria they don't have a cell wall they have lot of sterols in their cell membrane they have lot of cholesterol they have a three layered membrane which is called a trilamellar unit membrane they are called pplos because they were identified in a disease which is called pleuropneumonia that is found in cattle and that's why it is called pleuropneumonia like organisms they do not have a cell wall they live under anaerobic conditions they are saprophytic and parasitic they are not only 
parasitic to animals then they are also parasitic to plants protista includes exclusively unicellular eukaryotic now we are done with prokaryotic organisms in monera in protista we have included all the single celled or unicellular eukaryotic organisms so in that we have classified them into photosynthetic protista slime molds and protozoan protista so here you can see a photosynthetic protist belonging to division euglenophyta that is euglena and these two belong to protozoa amoeba and paramecium chrysophyta are those which include desmids which are called golden algae as well as diatoms they are the principal producers of the ocean and they have for example if you take these diatoms for that matter they have a cell wall which resemble a soap box a, a bigger valve fitted into a smaller valve the bigger valve is called the epitheca and the smaller valve is called the hypotheca and then there is a cytoplasm inside there is a protoplast there is a huge vacuole inside and the nucleus is suspended in the vacuole by protoplasmic or cytoplasmic threads like this so this is how a diatom looks like and then in the cell wall there are encrustations of silica the cell wall is heavily impregnated with silica and that's why it is virtually indestructible and when this cell wall uh, animal inside sorry the organism inside the cell inside dies the cell walls get deposited at the bottom of the ocean in the sea floor as diatomaceous earth or diatomite which is also called the kaisel gur this is used in night paints it is used in night paints it is used as a clean, cleaning agent in polishes and toothpaste it also has low thermal conductivity it is used as uh, insulator in boilers and furnaces and refrigerators okay because it has a glistening or a very good reflective ability it is also used in night paints in highways dinoflagellates the most important feature of dinoflagellates is now if this is they have a very very heavily armored cell wall now if this is a dinoflagellate for example they have cellulose plates in their cell wall which are tightly fitted into each other and they have grooves a horizontal groove which is referred to as simply as a groove and a vertical groove which is referred to as the sulcus and from there you have these flagella which emerge out and flagella are at right angles to each other okay some of them undergo rapid multiplication so the groove which is circular is called a girdle it's mentioned here and the one that is vertical is referred to as the sulcus some of them re uh, reproduce very quickly to produce red tides like for example goniolax and some of them are also very uh, poisonous to fishes okay two types of flagella which are beating continuously at right angles and that's why they are called whirling webs example is goniolax and gymnodenium euglenoids like we saw euglena there was a confusion as to whether to call it a plant or an animal because euglena does not have a cell wall correct it has a proteinaceous covering on it which is called pellicle it has two flagella they have a special type of eye spot which has an eye pigment that is called astaxanthin so remember that the eye spot helps them to migrate towards light uh, areas where there is sunlight sometimes when there is no sunlight they can also behave as heterotrophs we call this as mixotrophic nutrition they have a special reserve food material that is called paramyelin so it's mentioned here they have astaxanthin which acts as the photosensitive eye spot which is sensitive to light they have a prominent contractile vacuole because they are freshwater bodies they reproduce by longitudinal binary fission slime molds or saprophytic protists now something which is very very unique about these slime molds is that they mostly creep and crawl over dead and decaying organic matter and moist places on the forest floor and they are basically made up of an aggregation that is referred to as a plasmodium a plasmodium is nothing but a huge mass of protoplasm with many 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 nuclei inside there are no partitions between the nuclei and therefore it appears to be a gigantic cell which multiple nuclei inside this is what is referred to as a plasmodium during unfavorable condition they develop stalks with sporangia on them now whenever the conditions become unfavorable they develop sporangia on them okay and now what happens from these sporangia is spores are produced which are carried by air currents and these spores break open 
and these tiny cells come out of the spores either the spore germinates into these tiny cells which are called myxamoebae or it produces these elongated spindle shaped cells which have two flagella at their end so these are called swarmers and this is called myxamoebae this is the spore did you understand and this is the multinucleate mass of protoplasm that is referred to as plasmodium so the plasmodium develop these sporangia during unfavorable conditions the spore are carried the spore either gives rise to myxamoebae or it gives rise to these swarmers and then what happens is one or more swarmers that are produced by the spores and you have these myxamoebae that are produced they all fuse together in pairs so two swarmers fuse together or two myxamoebae fuse together and ultimately they result in the formation of zygote so either the swarmers fuse to form a zygote or the myxamoebae fuse together to form a diploid zygote and the zygote will start growing and growing and growing and it becomes a plasmodium so very simplified life cycle now what i have considered here is referred to as a cellular plasmodium okay what i have taken here as an example is a cellular plasmodium so remember there is a plasmodium which have multiple nuclei in them so these are all the nuclei it's a mass of protoplasm with many many nuclei in them and they bear these erect sporangia the sporangia give out spores during unfavorable condition the spores germinate into either myxamoebae or swarm cells with two flagella at their ends the swarm cells um fuse in pairs either these fuse or these fuse but whenever they fuse the ultimate product is zygote the zygote germinates into another plasmodium okay protozoans include amoeboid protozoans now protozoa is another division under kingdom protista they include amoeboid protozoans like free living amoeba parasitic entamoeba and free living elpidium which is aquatic which have silica cell shell on their surface then you have flagellated protozoans which have whip like flagella as their locomotory structure and the parasitic forms such as trypanosoma okay then ciliated protozoans you have the slipper animal cule which is paramecium which have these fine hair like cilia on the surface so basically the classification is based on locomotory appendages then you have sporozoa sporozoans do not have any specific locomotory structures and the most common sporozoan which causes disease in humans and uh, which uses the female anopheles as a vector is plasmodium all right so this gives you an overview of the classification of uh, division protozoa under kingdom protista now moving on to kingdom fungi fungi are heterotrophic they cannot manufacture their own food they don't have chlorophyll of their own but they produce spore and they can also reproduce sexually they have these elongated slender filamentous structures called hyphae the hyphae we have multiple nuclei in them like i am showing here in this case it is called a cenocytic or an aseptate hyphae sometimes the hypha can have partitions in them and between the partitions you can see the nuclei it may be uninucleate or binucleate so this is referred to as a septate hypha so these tube like structures are called hypha many of these tubes are intertwined to form a mass of these filaments or a mass of hypha which is referred to as the mycelium another thing is each fungal cell has a special cell wall the cell wall is made up of something called cellulose sorry not cellulose in this case in plants it is cellulose in case of fungus the cell wall is made up of chitin and chitin is nothing but uh, also found in arthropod exoskeleton and chitin is also called fungal cellulose they are saprophytic they feed on dead and decaying organic matter they are mostly found in moist places correct they live in moist environment they may be parasitic or symbiotic like in the case of lichens and mycorrhiza where they form symbiotic association with the roots of higher plants reproduction in the fungi may be by fragmentation where they split fission in east and budding in east 
that is by vegetative means which is a type of asexual reproduction sexual reproduction may be involving formation of now there are other sorry let me finish asexual reproduction there are many other structures involved in asexual reproduction like formation of flagellated zoospores formation of non motile spores by specialized structures i told you that sometimes in just like we saw in uh, slime mounds in fungi also some of the hyphae may become erect and they may develop a structure at their ends which are called sporangia which start producing these non motile spores so sometimes the spores produced are non motile or it may be motile and flagellated there are different spores which are a product of sexual reproduction which is called oospore ascospore and basidiospores now during fungal sexual reproduction what you need to remember is now let me say this is one hypha and this is another hypha so let me draw partitions because it is septate so let me show these solid nuclei here and hollow nuclei to create a distinction now say for example this hypha has a sex organ which is called the male sex organ or the antheridium we call it as the plus strain and this hypha has a sex organ which is the female sex organ or the archegonium or the oogonium the minus strain so what happens during sexual reproduction is the contents of the male sex organ enter into the female sex organ and then finally this female sex organ will now have two nuclei in it one that belongs to itself and one that came from the male Uh, sex organ and of course the cytoplasm of the male sex organ and the cytoplasm of the female sex organ have become mingled with each other now this coming together or the mixing up of the cytoplasm of the male and the female or the plus and the minus strain is called plasmogamy but can you see that the nucleus is still separate now this is the male nucleus which came from the antheridium and this is the female nucleus that was already there so this condition where the nucleus is still separate and there are two nuclei is referred to as the dikaryotic stage or the dikaryon subsequently what will happen is within this uh, ascogonium or the female sex organ both the male and the female nuclei will merge together and they will form a new nucleus let me shade it to create a distinction and this is now referred to as the zygote nucleus now this is not the end the zygote nucleus within the female sex organ will now undergo meiosis zygotic meiosis now what happens is the the cell also enlarges in size and now the meiosis has produced a total of 1 2 3 4 nuclei and each of these nuclei will get rounded off into spores and the spores will get dispersed the spores will get released isn't it and these spores which are released will germinate on a suitable substratum and they will produce a new fungal hypha so this is the summary of the sexual reproduction in fungi so i hope you followed there is a male sex organ called antheridium there is a female sex organ or gametangia called ascogonium the contents of the male sex organ migrate into the female their cytoplasm merges by a process called plasmogamy but what is yet to happen i mean the cell now becomes uh, uh the cell now possesses two nuclei it's called a dikaryon now what happens is the nuclei fuse i forgot to write here the fusion of the nuclei is called karyogamy okay fusion of cytoplasm is called plasmogamy fusion of nucleus is called uh, karyogamy now you have a zygote nucleus with us the zygote nucleus will undergo meiosis to form haploid spores so these are referred to as the haploid sexual spores why are they haploid because the zygote nucleus underwent meiosis they get rounded off with an envelope of cytoplasm around themselves and a wall that is generated around them they are dispersed and when they migrate and they fall on a suitable substratum they will germinate into a new hypha so this dikaryon is what you usually refer to as the temporary dikaryophase in the life cycle or in the sexual cycle of the fungus 
Moving on to Phycomycetes, the first class of fungus, they live on decaying wood in moist and damp places. Some of them are aquatic and obligate parasites. The mycelium uh, do not have septae like I told you. It is a tube or a filament with many many nuclei. There is no partition or cross wall. So we call such a hypha as xenocytic. Asexual reproduction may happen through flagellated zoospores or non-motile aplanospores that are produced by sporangia. Since they are produced inside the sporangia, we can call them as endogenous. And then you can see that the zygospore, I told you, zygote is formed by the fusion of two gametes which may be isogamous if the gametes are alike. If the male gamete and the female gamete look exactly alike each other, then it is called isogamous. If they are slightly different, it is anisogamous. If the female gamete is large and spherical and resembling an egg, then it is referred to as the oogamous type of sexual reproduction. So examples are mucor, rhizopus and capital A albugo. So you have to know the modes of asexual and sexual for each class. Okay. Now here you can see some examples rhizopus, albugo and muca. In ascomycetes also the same process happens. If you remember I had told you that there is a male sex organ. Let me show you in the form of the solid nuclei here. And then I had shown you that there is a hypha, a female hypha which has the female sex organ here. In same thing happens the contents of the male sex organ are passed on to the female sex organ. I am giving you a generalized idea. And then if you take the female sex organ here. The female sex organ will now have male nucleus and female nucleus in it. Male and female but what has fused? The cytoplasm has undergone fusion. Plasmogamy has happened. Now what happens is the karyogamy does not take place immediately here. Now this female sex organ which has these two nuclei, one solid and one circular, one hollow which is the male and female will now start producing new hyphae. See, on all the sides it will start producing new hyphae and each of these hyphae will be septate and they will have two nuclei in them. The same two nuclei will be multiplied and will be passed on to each of these hyphae which are there in the, uh, which are a product of what? Plasmogamy, isn't it? Now, in the terminal cells of this hyphae, these are called ascogenous hyphae. In the terminal cell of this hyphae, let me take this terminal cell, the male and the female will merge together. And what is this fusion called where the nuclei fuse? It is called karyogamy and they undergo meiosis and like I said the cell becomes huge and you have these spores which are produced over here which get rounded off and these spores are referred to as the ascospores and this terminal cell becomes a huge balloon like cell and this is called an ascus. Did you understand? Karyogamy does not happen in the sex cell. Karyogamy does not happen inside this cell. It happens inside these hyphae. Which cell of the hyphae? The terminal cells of the hyphae. In the terminal cells of the hyphae, there are a lot of more details which I am not delving into details here because of the shortage of time. So in the terminal cells, the two nuclei come together. What do we call the process where the two nuclei fuse? We call it as karyogamy so the two nuclei come together and they form a zygote nucleus and the zygote nucleus undergoes meiosis to form ascospores and this cell the terminal cell becomes massive in size and it becomes a sac like cell this is called the ascus and that's why these fungi are referred to as what are they referred to as i'm sorry so that's why we call these ascomycetes as what sac fungi because they have sac like cells which have ascospores developing inside them and you find these sac like cells aggregated in a group I told you these are the terminal cells of the hyphae and they are producing ascospores inside and this kind of a body where you find a group of asci or ascus together is called a fruiting body or it is called an ascocarp. Alright? 
Examples include Aspergillus, Claviceps, Neurospora and Penicillium. And of course, Ascospores reproduce mostly by these uh, very small and uh, uh, smooth walled and thin walled spores which are referred to as conidia they have hyphae the hyphae becomes erect and upright at the tip of the hyphae you can find these cells which form a beaded arrangement like this and these cells which get cut off from this and this particular structure is a conidia and the conidia will break open and it will produce a germ tube which will mature into a new hyphae so these asexual structures which are bone on these upright hyphae and these are called the conidio these upright or aerial hyphae are called the conidiophore and these chains of cells each cell here is referred to as a conidium okay so this is the mode of what asexual reproduction basidiomycetes also exhibit uh, sexual reproduction predominantly however their asexual reproduction spores are missing in them completely they reproduce only by fragmentation through uh, uh, asexual reproduction and something unique happens in them if this is one hypha and if this is another hypha again let us say that this has solid nuclei and this has hollow nuclei and uh, we ca call this as the male or the plus strain and the female or the minus strain each and every cell in the hypha will fuse together and the resulting hypha as you can expect will happen will have what two nuclei because it is a product of plasmogamy and this is referred to as the dikaryotic hypha and do you know that it is this process where there is entire fusion of hypha this type of sexual reproduction is called somatogamy and these hypha which are uh, uninucleate are called are belonging to a body called promycelium so promycelium fuse together to form dikaryotic hypha it is this dikaryotic hypha that takes the shape of a mushroom that are, that you are very much aware of and the mushroom produces spores these spores are called the basidiospores so what are the sexual spores called they are called basidiospores the basidiospores when they fall on a suitable substratum they will germinate into a new hypha Clear? so there is a dikaryotic phase and in the dikaryotic phase the mycelium will take shape into a mushroom so we call this mushroom as a fruiting body like how in ascomycetes we called it as ascocarp here we are going to call it as basidiocarp the basidiocarp is the one that is going to produce it is understood that karyogamy takes place the nuclei ultimately merge together to form what zygote nucleus and will the zygote nucleus simply stay as it is no it will undergo meiosis to form special spores called basidiospores in ascomycetes it was ascospores in basidiomycetes it is called basidiospores okay examples agaricus eustilago puxenia puxenia is the one that causes we trust you should be thorough with each and every example that is given in your ncrt textbooks please bear that in mind some of the examples of uh, basidiomycetes deutromycetes are called the last division under kingdom uh, mycota or kingdom fungi they are called imperfect fungi because they do not exhibit any sexual stages they reproduce only by asexual or vegetative phases the reproduction is exhibited mostly by conidia and as of now if you discover any sexual reproduction phase in them then you will remove that species from deutromycetes and you will put it in some other species in some other division okay so but the members of deutromycetes do not exhibit sexual reproduction mycelium is septate there are cross walls with the nuclei in between them and they are branched correct examples include alternaria coletotrichum trichoderma and cercospora Trichoderma is not a parasite, the others are parasites. 
We know that fungi also form symbiotic association with algae, specifically mostly it is the blue-green algae. Such symbiotic associations formed between the fungal hypha or mycelium and algae is referred to as, what do we call it as? We call it as lichens. Okay. Now what is this? What is the use of the fungus and alga coming together? The alga makes food for the fungus and the fungus provides a protective covering to the alga and also the fungus, the hypha of the fungus absorbs nutrients and water for the alga. So both are benefited from each other, isn't it? And they cannot live without each other. So it is called as mutualism. They are, mutually ex uh, they are mutually dependent on each other, isn't it? So the alga gives food to the fungus, the fungus gives water, nutrients and protection. They are called bio-indicators because wherever you see lichens, mostly you must have seen lichens growing on the barks of trees, very common to see. And if you see them growing extensively on the bark of trees, you can be rest assured that there is no pollution in the surrounding environment and they are indicative of sulfur dioxide pollution whenever there is more wherever there is more pollution you will not see these lichens there are different types of lichens called fruticose lichens crustose lichens folios fruticose lichens are those lichens which grow as a bunch so they grow as a bunch or a bush they are attached to the substratum with an attachment disc Okay, and crustose lichens, they grow as a crust, as a thin surface on the bark of the trees. And folios lichen are those which grow like, which give the appearance of leaf. So based on their growth pattern, that is whether they grow as a bush with an attachment disc attached to it, or whether they grow as a mat or as a crust, which is very closely oppressed to the surface on which they are growing or whether they grow as a leaf-like structure, we can classify them as fruticose, crustose and folios. Example for fruticose is usnea, example for crustose is rhizocarpon, example for folios is parmelia. Okay, so with this we end the lecture the crash course synopsis of both the chapter diversity of the living world as well as of biological classification. So I wish you all all the very best in your preparation for your upcoming NEET exam. So have a good time and take care all of you. Thank you. So welcome to Deeksha online all of you for NEET crash course uh, 2020 and now we are going to discuss about the next chapter in today's NEET crash course that is Animal Kingdom. Now Kingdom Animalia as you all are aware it includes heterotrophic and eukaryotic organisms and we have to learn some of the fundamental features of animals before getting into the details of the animal kingdom. So one by one let us delve with <clears throat> the fundamental aspects of animal kingdom. So you know the different levels of organization. Now animals may be cellular they may have a group of cells which are not forming a tissue like in the case of sponges. Cells may come together and they perform a similar function and they exhibit similar structure. Then we call them as tissues like it starts from seal and treta. And then we have tissues which come together to form organ. The first phylum to exhibit organ level of organization is platyhelminthes and however organ system level of organization is as you all are aware it is the roundworms. So these are the different levels of organization. Then moving on to symmetry, body symmetry. Now body symmetry refers to how the, how the different parts of the body are arranged with respect to a common axis, with respect to a body axis. If you cannot divide the body into two equal halves along any plane, then they are asymmetrical. Please learn the examples also, amoeba, snail and sponges. If you can divide them into similar parts, they are called symmetrical. There are two types of symmetry, that is radial symmetry and bilateral symmetry. Now, if an organism is uh, radially symmetrical, then any plane passing through this central, this dot represents the central axis, any plane passing through the central axis can divide the body of the animal into two equal halves. But if it is bilaterally symmetrical, say for example, if it is a planaria or a worm, then there is only one plane along which you can divide the body of the organism into two equal halves and then we call it as bilateral symmetry. So radial symmetry and bilateral symmetry are the two major types of symmetry you must remember. Examples for radial symmetry are coelenterates, stenophores and echinoderms and bilateral symmetry all vertebrates however it starts with 
you have some of the nematodes that is Ascalmenthes and Annelida, Orthropoda, etc. So here you can see the example. Now this is the central axis. You are cutting it along the central axis. Along any plane that passes through the central axis, you get two equal halves. Whereas if you see a turtle, uh, that is, uh, if there is only one plane along the midline of the body, which gives you two equal halves. And if you see a sponge, you cannot divide it into two similar parts along any plane and that's why it is asymmetrical. Body layers are diploblastic and triploblastic. Now you have taken a section. So imagine the body is cylindrical like this. And when you cut open the body, you can see different layers. The cells in the body are arranged into different layers. If the cells are arranged into two layers, then we call them as diploblastic. For example, there is an inner layer that is called endoderm and an outer layer called ectoderm. However, here you can see an additional layer that is the mesoderm. So there is outer ectoderm, middle mesoderm, inner endoderm. So if the body wall of an organism consists of cells which are arranged in three distinct layers, then we call it as triploblastic. We call these layers as germ layers because they are first forming during the embryonic development. Then we have coelomates. If the organism has a true coelom, then we refer to it as a coelomate. Now, what is a true coelom? It should be lined with mesoderm on both sides. For example, you have taken a section of the body of an animal. You see the ectoderm. Okay. This is the ectoderm which I have shown, and this is the endoderm which is lined, which is lining the gut. The cavity here is called the gut. Okay. And then you have two coelomic spaces on both the sides. And this is lined by the middle layer which is referred to as the mesoderm. So such a lining, such a cavity that is lined with mesoderm on both sides is referred to as the true coelom. So it is lined both on the inside and on the outside by this middle layer. The middle layer is what is referred to as mesoderm. So this kind of an organization, this kind of an animal is said to be a coelomate. Examples for coelomates are annelids, mollusks, and arthropods, echinoderms, and hemichordates and including the members of phylum chordata, including ourselves. Pseudocelomates in the sense the coelom is not lined with mesoderm and the mesoderm is present in the form of scattered pouches. So for example, this is the ectoderm, this is the endoderm and the mesoderm is present in the form of pouches like this. So this cavity that you see here, on the inside there is endoderm, on the outside there is ectoderm. So you call this as a false coelom. And why it is not considered a true coelom? Because the mesoderm does not line the coelom. It is present in the form of scattered pouches in the space between the outer ectoderm and the inner endoderm. This is seen in the case of Ascalmenthes. However, if coelom is missing, like in the case of Platyhelminthes, then we say that the animal is a acelomate. Okay. Segmentation. In some animals, you can see that the body is divided into repeated external and internal segments like in the case of earthworms. It is called metamerism or segmentation. Notochord. In some animals, now if you consider a, a chordate organism on the dorsal side of the body, this is the dorsal, this is the ventral, this is anterior, this is posterior. So on the dorsal side of the body, you see a solid supporting rod-like structure. This solid supporting rod-like structure is referred to as the notochord. Now this notochord provides mechanical support to the body and it is actually derived from the mesoderm during the early embryonic development. And uh, Animals which do not possess notochord are referred to as the non-chordates. And above the notochord, you have another structure which is referred to as the nerve cord. There's another cylindrical structure, a hollow cylindrical structure. So the notochord is not hollow, whereas this upper tube which I'm showing is a hollow cylindrical structure which is referred to as the nerve cord, whereas the lower one that is present below the nerve cord, which is solid, supporting, rod-like structure, is referred to as the notochord, okay? Classification of animals. So you can see we have classified animals. So they belong to kingdom Animalia. The two levels of organization. We have broadly classified it into cellular level. And the advanced levels are put together. Tissue, organ and organ system level of organization. There is only one phylum under uh, cellular level. That is Polyphera. Under tissue, organ and organ system level. They can further be classified based on their symmetry. Under radial symmetry you have phylum Coelentrata, phylum Tenophora which is 
comb jellies and under bilateral symmetry you have animals which have which do not have so again you are classifying symmetry based on body cavity or coelom so a coelomates pseudo coelomate false coelom and coelomates which usually have a true coelom that is lined with mesoderm on both sides now this table is extremely important for your neat exam because this table is there in your ncert exam they can pick this table they can ask you this in the form of fill in the blanks or they can uh, omit some of the text in this and they can ask you to choose the correct option so it is very important to your with this table you have to learn all the examples you have to revise you've learned all of this in your first year so you have to revise all of these phyla to which each of them belong to okay now moving on to a very quick recap of what are the different phyla invertebrate phyla we will start off with first of all we start off with porifera now in porifera some of the words you need to remember is the body has openings minute openings called ostia there is one single large opening called osculum and what enters through the ostia the sea water enters through the ostia and this system is called the water canal system there is a central cavity in the body what is the central cavity in the body called it is called the spongo seal or the paragast cavity isn't it the body wall is diploblastic they have an outer layer called pinacoderm and an inner layer called coanoderm it is very important to note that the coanoderm has cells which have a collar like structure which is actually microvilli and they have a flagella in the center like this and these are referred to as the collar cells the presence of collar cells which are also called the coanocyte is a very important feature of phylum porifera they are holozoic their digestion happens inside their body cells intracellular they have spicules and spongin fibers for their mechanical support they undergo budding or gemule and external uh, sorry fertilization happens internally that is the sperm and the egg fuse inside the body they are hermaphroditic now that is not mentioned here it is important to remember that most of the sponges are hermaphroditic that is that this is a term that is used to denote what condition it is used to denote bisexual condition and we say that development is indirect because there is a larval stage and they also exhibit a very high power of regeneration example cycon cycon is called the urn sponge okay so cycon or scypha and then new spongia or bath sponge spongilla is the only fresh water sponge which mostly exhibits these structures which are perennating structures to tide over unfavorable condition called gemmules Coelentrata. How is Coelentrata advanced? I think Coelentrata is the first phylum to exhibit the tissue grade of organization or tissue level of organization. Okay, and they are marine. They may be sessile or free swimming. Sessile means they are always fixed to the substratum. They are radially symmetrical. They also have uh, two layers in their body wall, separated by a gelatinous substance called mesoglea. okay the two layers are outer epidermis inner gastrodermis and uh, one important thing very very important thing is they exhibit two basic body forms one is called a polyp now you all are aware how a polyp is it is cylindrical and it has a crown of tentacles on it isn't it now this is a polyp and medusa is umbrella shaped like you all have seen jellyfishes okay so two forms of uh, body can be seen one is called the polyp or the hydrant and one is umbrella shape which is called medusa now example for polyp is adamsia and hydra and for medusa it is jellyfish and you also have heard about alternation of generation there are some animals for example you have obelia now obelia is commonly called sea fur it can exist both as a polyp as well as as a medula medusa and it exhibits a very unique type of a life cycle called metagenesis now what happens in metagenesis now this is something very important with regard to coelentrata you have the polyp state the polyp state reproduces asexually to give rise to the medusa the medusa which are set free reproduce sexually to give rise to polyp so sexual reproduction is undertaken by medusa and asexual reproduction is undertaken by polyp and this alternation of generation alternation of sexual and asexual generations is called metagenesis then they have stinging cells called nidoblasts or nematoblasts so basically they have a stinging cell with a stinging apparatus inside the stinging apparatus or the stinging capsule is called a cyst so don't get confused between nematocyst and nematoblast if you hear the word cyst it is the capsule suppose this is the cell 
then inside the cell there is a capsule where there is a coiled thread with poison inside okay this capsule is called a cyst and the cell which has a nucleus and cytoplasm and all that is called a blast so you can also call this capsule as a nidocyst whereas the cell is referred to as a nidoblast or a nematoblast and you can imagine there is a trigger on top that is called the nidocell if this nidocell comes into contact with another organism such as the prey then you can see this thread will get shot out like this and the thread is very very sharp and it pierces into the prey and delivers a paralytic toxin that's why this is called nidaria because they have stinging cells which are called nidoblasts or nematoblasts containing the stinging capsule called nidocyte or nematocyte and like i told you that diploblastic they have a jelly like substance or layer between the two layers of outer ectoderm and inner endoderm and this gelatinous layer is called mesoglia and then they have gastrovascular cavity for example if this is the hydra the body of hydra it is columnar and then there is an elevated region upon which there is mouth and there is a crown of tentacles like this surrounding the mouth there is a crown of tentacles this elevated ridge up below the mouth is referred to as the hypostome okay and then you have to remember that they have a cavity inside the cavity is referred to as the gastrovascular cavity or the coelenteron please note this and then we saw that there are two layers in the body wall the outer layer is called the ectoderm or it is called the epidermis and the inner layer is basically derived from the endoderm it is called the gastrodermis so the ectoderm gives rise to the epidermis which is the outermost layer of the body wall and the endoderm gives rise to the gastrodermis which is the inner layer of the body wall and like i told you between the two layers there is a gelatinous matrix and this gelatinous matrix is called the mesoglia okay fine so what are the examples of uh, phylum coelenterata you have physalia adamsia or sea animal physalia is called the portuguese man of war because it's like the war machine it is loaded with batteries and batteries of stinging cells that's why it's called the portuguese man of war pennatula is the sea pen gorgonia is the sea fan meandrina is the brain coral and i would like to mention that there are some corals mostly corals are polyps and now imagine this is a polyp it secretes so i'm focusing on this polyp here now it secretes a calcium carbonate shell on its outside and this calcium carbonate shell is what becomes uh, the coral and generally coral is not one polyp it is many many polyps which are living together okay tinophora is also called comb jelly and you are aware that they are called comb jelly because they have a spherical body they have uh, an apical uh, an aboral pole and a oral pole where mouth is present on the aboral pole they have two openings called anus anal pores are there and they have a special sense organ which helps in balancing the body called statosis extending from the oral to the aboral pole there are how many rows of comb plates there are eight meridional rows i've shown four over here but imagine there will be eight of them and along these row you can see these paddle like structures and if you were to magnify these paddle like structures you would see that they are paddles with cilia at their free margin and therefore they look like a comb and these paddles will flip upwards and downwards and it will help the animal to swim in water digestion is both extracellular intracellular it also has tissue level of organization the organization is very similar to what we saw in case of coelenterata they also have an outer ectoderm outer epidermis and inner gastrodermis so they have locomotory structures which i mentioned over here which is referred to as comb plates and mouth opens into a stomodium a stomodium is a special layer which is lined with a canal lined with ectoderm on the inside and then it opens into a broad cavity and this broad cavity is called the gastrovascular cavity which give out radial canals on both sides so inside the mouth there is a stomodium which leads into the gastrovascular cavity just like coelenteron the gastrovascular cavity is also called what is it called coelenteron but here we don't use the word coelenteron we just use the word that is gastrovascular cavity and then on both sides of the animal's body there are tentacular sheaths which bear elongated tentacles however these tentacles bear branches which do not have stinging cells but they have certain other special cells these special cells are glue secreting cells they are called coloblasts coloblasts or lasso cells 
okay and now coming to their reproduction they also exhibit bioluminescence they can emit light in darkness sexes are not separate they are hermaphroditic reproduction takes place only by sexual means fertilization is external that means the sperm and the egg meet in the surrounding water not inside the body of the parent and there is indirect development because there is a developmental larval stage example is pleurobrachia and tenoplana Platyhelminthes are dorsoventrally flattened body. You know that they are called flatworms. You can think of tapeworm and liver fluke, isn't it? They exhibit organs. So this is the first phylum to exhibit organ level of organization. They live inside the body of the host, endoparasites. That's the reason why they have a flat body because it will help them to navigate easily. What are some of the parasitic adaptations that you can think about when you talk about phylum platyhelminthes? <clears throat> So you have that they have uh, adhesive organs like hooks and suckers, they have a tough cuticle on the outside, they don't have sense organs, they are hermaphroditic, sexes are united. What is the use of having united sexes? They don't have to go looking around for the opposite sex for mating, isn't it? So they can reproduce very easily. Then they have an incomplete elementary canal, some of them don't even have a mouth. Like for example, tapeworm doesn't have a digestive system because they can directly absorb nutrition through their skin surface. They exhibit a saprozoic nutrition. And then they have special cells called flame cells or protonephridia which carry out excretion and osmoregulation. And these are also the first animals which show germs of cephalization because a few of the anterior segments organize themselves roughly into a structure which you can call it as head. Okay? Organs of locomotion are absent. Again, like I said, one of the parasitic adaptations is that they are hermaphroditic. Fertilization happens inside the body of the uh, parent organism. And, uh, and one of the examples of the free living platyhelminth, not all platyhelminths are parasitic. You should remember that one thing. So some of the free living paras uh, platyhelminths like planaria, that they exhibit a very high regenerative capacity. And if you talk about the parasitic forms, Tinea solium, which is the poke tape firm, and then you have fasciola hepatica, which is the liver fluke. Okay, now liver fluke, as you all are aware, it requires, uh, it mostly attacks what is called uh, the, the sheep, and it requires a snail in order to complete its life cycle. Ascalminthes, they are also called round worms because if you take a section, they appear round in section. That's why they are referred to as round worms. They have a cylindrical, unsegmented and thread-like body. Okay, They are bilaterally symmetrical, triploblastic and pseudocoelomate. But please remember, this is the first phylum to exhibit organ system level of organization. All right, and then they have excretory tubes in their body which help in removing excretory waste intracellular tubes are present they are dioecious meaning sexes are separate and sexual dimorphism is very clear fertilization happens inside the body of the female development may be direct if there is no larval stage or it may be indirect with larval stage examples are ascaris which is commonly called round worm Uchuraria, which is commonly called filarial worm that is transmitted by the female culex mosquito whereas ascaris the round worm is transmitted by contaminated food and water ankylostoma or hookworm is also transmitted directly through uh, by walking barefooted the larva can bore into the skin of the person so basically you have a lot of parasites which are included under this phylum called phylum Ascalminthes or Nematelminthes. Okay. Phylum Annelida. What, what is the unique nature, nature of Annelida? They are free living or they may be ectoparasites. They are coelomate. They also have an organ system level of organization. You've seen the body of earthworm, how its body is divided into ring like segments, isn't it? So the body consists of metameric segmentation. This is something which is unique to Phylum Annelida. They have both longitudinal muscles in the body which run along the length of the body as well as circular muscles which run along the horizontal or along the um, circumference of the body. And then you have some of the animals which are nearest. Nearest is actually unisexual. Not all of them are unisexual or sexes are not separate in all of them. But in nearest the sexes are separate and they have special fleshy appendages. For example, if these are the segments of nearest 
you can see fleshy appendages on both sides and these fleshy appendages bear bristle like structures on them now these structures which help this worm since this worm lives in the sea it acts as paddle it helps in locomotion these are called parapodia if you see earthworm on each segment there are s shaped chitinous structures these s shaped chitinous structures are called as setae they help in getting a grip on the soil when the earthworm is burrowing in the soil they have a complete digestive system with mouth and anus a closed circulatory system they have uh, usually if you take earthworm you have four pairs of hearts in earthworm isn't it so basically you have um, uh, a closed circulatory system which helps in and you have nephridia the excretory structure is nephridia which help in both osmoregulation and excretion Neural system consists of paired ganglia which are connected by lateral nerves and double ventral nerve cord and one thing you should remember is if this is the body of the earthworm from the side view you are looking at and if this is the digestive system say this is the buccal cavity this is the pharynx and this is the esophagus all of you remember you will find these ganglia which are paired swollen structures above the pharynx it's called suprapharyngeal ganglia and then from both the ganglia you have these connectives which come down and below the pharynx they unite together to form subpharyngeal which are a paired ganglia called subpharyngeal ganglia and then on the ventral side you have double ventral see two nerve cords are originating from the subpharyngeal ganglia and at every regular interval you have abdominal or uh, the segmental ganglia so this is called a double ventral nerve cord and since these two structures which are called the primitive brain these are located above the pharynx we call them as cerebral ganglia or the correct word to use is suprapharyngeal because it is above the pharynx nearest like i said is an aquatic form which is dioecious meaning the sexes are separate whereas earthworm and leeches are both monoecious in case of nearest fertilization is external in case of leech fertilization is internal in leech development is direct in nearest it is indirect because it includes a larva called trochophore larva see a free living trochophore larva nearest is commonly called the brizzle worm or the sand worm and ferritima is commonly called earthworm and hirudinaria is the blood sucking leech largest phylum of the animal kingdom is phylum arthropoda the most ubiquitous the most cosmopolitan phylum in animal kingdom organ system level bilateral symmetry triploblastic but most important thing the, this is the first phylum to have invaded the land entirely and these are the first phylum which include animals which developed a pair of wings like insects for the first time took to the air isn't it so what made them so capable of invading land because they had an exoskeleton their body has a covering on the outside which is called cuticle which is heavily deposited with the pigment sorry with the substance called chitin they possess jointed appendages orthros meaning jointed and podos meaning legs the leg is not a single unit but it is consisting of several segments joined together their body consists of three divisions this is called tagmosis the body exhibits a phenomenon called tagmosis where you can divide the body into head thorax and abdomen respiratory organs like in case of aquatic forms it is gills in case of uh, horseshoe crab or king crab which is a living fossil you have book gills then there are book lungs in the case of aquatic arach sorry uh, terrestrial arachnids like scorpion and in insects especially terrestrial forms you have tracheal system which are tubes which carry air in them they have a complete digestive system and circulatory system is open very important there are no blood vessels and the blood is freely flowing inside the body cavity such a body cavity that is filled with the blood is referred to as the hemocele so we say that the coelom or the body cavity in these organisms is called a hemocele because blood is freely circulating within the hemocele okay sensory organs are present excretion through malpighian tubules very very important the structures of excretion in arthropoda are malpighian tubules sexes are separate they are dioecious and fertilization usually there is transfer of sperm from the male into the female reproductive tract which is called internal fertilization females lay eggs and that's why females are called oviparous sometimes there are larval stages when we say that the development is indirect if there is no larval stage we say that the development is direct it's very important to learn these examples economically important examples like apis bombyx and lacifer vectors which spread diseases like anopheles culex 
insects and aedes gregarious pests which cause damage to agricultural crops like in the case of locusta and living fossil which is limulus which is horseshoe crab or king crab and limulus is the one which is called a living fossil because it has retained some of its ancestral traits over the course of evolution okay mollusca it is the second largest phylum so the first largest phylum is orthopoda the second largest phylum is mollusca now important thing is the body of mollusks is covered by a shell and it has three parts for example if you take this is the head of the mollusk and then you have the body which is extended into a fold like this and then you have the main part with a foot like this and this is called the visceral hump where much of the body parts are present this is the head and this is the foot and what is this extension of the skin this fleshy fold on the body this is called the mantle and the mantle is the one that secretes what on its outside that secretes a shell that is made up of calcium carbonate and can you see the space between the mantle and the visceral hump this is called the mantle cavity in this mantle cavity you will find feather shaped gills which are referred to as tinea which help in respiration also openings of the nephridia which is the excretory structure openings of the digestive system which is the anus all of these openings are found in this cavity called the mantle cavity and the head has uh, sensory tentacles as you can see in the snail there are tentacles which originate in eye spots and then most importantly inside the mouth if you see the mouth of this particular organism now let me show you here imagine that it is opening its mouth it is opening a tongue like structure which is a long tape like a file like a very sharp chitinous structure which is referred to as the radula the radula helps in scraping the food it is called as a rasping organ the file like rasping organ which is provided with several chitinous teeth like how we have tongue they have an elongated ribbon like chitinous structure with have lot of chitinous teeth on them that is called radula then feather like gills like i told you or in some cases there may be an opening like say for example here there is an opening which leads into a huge sac where air or gaseous exchange takes place and such sacs are referred to as the pulmonary sacs okay open type of circulatory system there is no blood vessels and blood may contain copper containing pigment that is referred to as hemocyanin they are mostly unisexual of course bisexual forms are also there oviparous the female lay egg and fertilization may happen in the outside environment or it may happen inside the female body the apila is the apple snail pintada is the pearl oyster sepia is the cuttlefish loligo is the squid octopus is commonly called the devil fish aplysia is the sea hare dentalium is the tusk shell ketoplura is chiton so please remember these are the common names also okay so octopus is the devil fish aplysia is the sea hare okay and then moving on to phylum echinodermata the body is covered with lot of spines that's why it is called echinodermata another unique feature is adults are radially symmetrical like a starfish with five arms is radially symmetrical but the larvae are bilaterally symmetrical they have a complete digestive system with mouth on the ventral surface and anus on the upper or the aboral surface they have a tube a network of tubes which are circulating inside the body which carry sea water in them this is called the ambulacral system the opening of the ambulacral system is a mesh like opening which is referred to as the madreporite so if you see the starfish it has uh, five arms like this now this surface where you find anus is the aboral surface on the under surface there is mouth in the center which is the aboral surface close to the anus there will be a structure with a mesh like structure uh, network on it which is referred to as the madreporite the madreporite leads into tubes on the inside and which carry water into these pipelines there are a lot of pipelines inside there is a ring and there are tubes given out into each of these arms which are referred to as the radial canals and then from the radial canals you can see the tubes which originate on the sides which are called lateral canals and from the lateral canals let me magnify here there is a balloon like structure which originates which is referred to as the tube feed with which the starfish 
walks, isn't it? It walks on the sea floor. Now, whenever it takes the sea water in, into into this madreporite, the sea water gets filled into this balloon-like structure, and it makes this balloon-like structure very sturdy. And this feet-like portion, with having which has a sucker at its end to hold on to the substratum, it uses this tube feet in order to move. So there are a lot of tube feet on the under surface of the body of a starfish. Okay. Endoskeleton, then just beneath the skin, they have numerous calcareous plates called ossicles. So they basically, you can call it as endoskeleton because it is beneath the skin. Excretory system is absent, but they show a high power of regeneration. Very important to note that probably by simple diffusion. And just now we talked about the water vascular system or the ambulacral system, which may help in transport of uh, excretory waste into the surrounding seawater. They are obviously sexes are separate. There is no uh, sexual dimorphism and fertilization as a rule is always external development is indirect because there are larval stages before it forms the adult asterius is the starfish echinus is the sea uh, urchin antidon is the sea lily cucumeria is the sea cucumber and ophiura is the brittle star okay so these are the examples you need to know Hemichordata was earlier included under chordata, that's why the name is hemichordata here. But later they identified, they had seen that in this animal which has a collar, which has a proboscis, a, this structure is called the proboscis and then a collar and then it has a body and then... So this is basically the body with two flaps of skin like this and with gills at its end on its either sides. So in the proboscis, they saw that these scientists had discovered a rod-like structure extending into the proboscis from the collar and they thought it is notochord but later they identified it is not the notochord. They called it the stomochord because it was present at the roof of the mouth and this stomochord later came to be known as the buccal diverticulum and therefore they later decided okay this is not the notochord so we should not place it in chordata, we should place it under non-chordata or invertebrata. They exhibit bilateral symmetry triploblastic coelomate animals and they have a uh, organ system level of organization i told you that they have many pairs of gill openings in the form of paired openings on the dorsal side of the body so what you're seeing here is the dorsal side of the body okay Circulatory system is of open type and in the proboscis they have a special gland which is referred to as the proboscis gland which helps in excretion. Sexes are separate and fertilization happens in the outside water and development is indirect because there is involvement of uh, larva and the examples include balanoglossus or sacoglossus. So now moving on to the next major phylum which is referred to as the phylum chordata to which we belong. So we have, now if you imagine this to be the hypothetical chordate that I started off in the beginning of this chapter, we have a dorsal tubular nerve cord which is hollow, a dorsal solid supporting rod like structure which is called notochord and in our pharynx or the throat region we have gills and then we have a uh, there is anus which is the opening of our digestive system beyond the anus we have a tail and most importantly if this is the ventral side on the ventral side of the body we have a heart so having a dorsal hollow nerve cord a dorsal solid supporting solid supporting rod like notochord having pharyngeal gill slits having a ventral heart having a post anal tail these are some of the features of phylum chordata now phylum chordata is divided into several subphylum some of them is urochordata and cephalochordata based on how often or how long do we retain the structure that develops during our embryonic development called notochord in urochordata the notochord is present in the larval tail but it is lost as the adult once the young one becomes an adult once the larva becomes the adult, it loses its notochord, it loses its tail also. Since originally the notochord is present in the tail, uro means tail, it's called urochordata. In cephalochordata, the notochord is retained throughout the life of the organism. It doesn't lose the notochord. And the third and the major subphylum that we talk about in this particular case is subphylum vertebrata. What is so unique about vertebrata? How are they different from urochordata and cephalochordata? Just now I mentioned to you, 
in urochord data the notochord is present only in the larval tail it is lost in the adult in cephalochord data they are persistent throughout the life in vertebrata what happens is during our embryonic development we possess a notochord so notochord is formed during our embryonic development but once the embryo develops into a young one after the embryonic development the notochord is replaced by a structure that is referred to as the vertebral column so since in us we don't have notochord throughout our life the notochord is replaced by vertebral column we call us as vertebrata and these two that is urochordata and cephalochordata are collectively referred to as protochordata primitive chordates now in subphylum uh, vertebrata we have two types of division now the first division is called agnatha they don't have jaw these are jawless vertebrates so important to note these are referred to as the jawless vertebrates the jawless vertebrates under them we have only one living class today that is cyclostomata they have a circular mouth they don't have jaws and they have skin without scales and they are slimy that's why they are not fishes they have endoskeleton which is cartilaginous they have exoskeleton that is scales are completely absent closed circulation two chambered heart very similar to fishes but they are not fishes because fishes have jaws but these creatures don't have jaws cyclostomes are marine but migrate to the fresh water for spawning that is to lay the eggs once the male and the female reproduce in the fresh water within days the male and the female die out and then the eggs hatch out into the larva the larva undergo metamorphosis in the river and it comes back to the ocean okay so the adults have to migrate to the rivers in order to lay the egg and deposit the sperm once the eggs hatch the larvae will undergo metamorphosis into the young one and after it metamorphosis the young one swims back into the ocean example is petromyzon which is lamprey and mixine which is hagfish now moving to superclass spices now here the topics the titles are not mentioned accurately so now we are moving to the next division the division gnathostomata gnathostomata means we possess the animals that possess jaws okay so animals that possess jaws are coming under gnathostomata and under gnathostomata we are now talking about superclass spices and under superclass spices we are talking about class chondrichthyes class chondrichthyes are nothing but cartilaginous fishes they have cartilage in their skeleton instead of bone there are two types of classes under superclass spices one is class chondrichthyes and one is class osteichthyes so subsequently we will learn about osteichthyes as well so chondrichthyes how are they different because they have a cartilaginous exoskeleton they have placoid scales which are very very minute and tridentate scales on the body which are barely visible to the naked eye and they have to keep swimming in water because they don't possess an air bladder normally in bony fishes they have an air bladder suppose they keep uh, they st stop swimming they don't sink because the air bladder is filled with air but these chondrichthyes do not have air bladders in them okay so then you have gill slits are separate without operculum and then you have the gill slits which are separate without operculum and gill cover and then you have mouth which is ventral uh, and alimentary canal opens into the cloacal aperture and they have a notochord which is persistent throughout their life very very important the notochord remains throughout their life okay some of them have electric organs like for example you have torpedo and some of them have poisonous sting for example you have the stingray now this torpedo is referred to as the electric ray and trigon is referred to as the stingray okay they are cold blooded because they are poikilothermous they they don't have the ability to maintain their body temperature their heart is two chambered their sexes are separate males will have special structures to transfer the sperm into the body of the female called claspers or copulatory organs and very important the males transport the sperm into the body of the female internal fertilization and the females are generally there are viviparous members also they are generally oviparous but most of the sharks are viviparous because they give birth to live young ones isn't it scoliodon is the dogfish and pristis is the sawfish carcharodon is the great white shark and trigon is the stingray 
Now, austic thighs, like I told you, again belongs to superclass spices, but it includes bony endoskeleton, and they can swim in water with the help of fins, and their fins are supported with cartilaginous and bony rays, or rays are nothing but uh, the bony supports which are present in the fins. Okay, and uh, they have a gill which is covered with an operculum or the gill cover. Air bladder is present. Heart is two chambered. They are cold-blooded or poikilothermic. Their sexes are separate. Fertilization is usually external. That is, the male and the female liberate the sperm and the egg to the outside environment where fertilization takes place. They are mostly oviparous or egg-laying and development does not involve a larval stage. It is direct. So you have marine forms like exocetus. You have hippocampus, seahorse, freshwater forms which are edible like labio, catla, clarius, aquarium fishes like betta which is the fight fish and terophyllum which is the angel fish so amphibia now amphibians have originated from what is uh, from the pisces from the fishes and amphibians live on both uh, water as well as in land and they have two pairs of pentadactyl limbs pentadactyl meaning they have digits which are five usually they have five digits in their four limbs and only four in their uh, sorry four digits in their four limbs and five digits in their hind limbs and they don't have nails or claws but they have webbed digits to help them use their limbs as paddles in water their body is divisible into head and trunk neck is absent they're cold blooded they have protrusible sticky tongue their skin is moist they don't have scales they have eyelids eyes have eyelids and they have a transparent eyelid called nictitating membrane their external ear has an eardrum behind their eye which is called the tympanum they have all their alimentary canal digestive system excretory system reproductive system opening into a common passage so if this is the opening this is a common chamber so into this opens the digestive system into this opens the excretory system into this opens the reproductive system and all the material collect in this chamber and are then excreted out so this is referred to as a common chamber that is called the cloacal chamber the opening of the cloacal chamber is called the cloacal aperture they have cutaneous respiration they can breathe through their skin they can breathe through their mouth and their pharyngeal lining they can breathe through gills like in case of tadpoles they have three chambers in their heart two upper chambers and one lower chamber sexes are separate and male and female deposit their gametes in the surrounding water water medium is required for fertilization females deposit eggs which are called oviparous and development is indirect because there is involvement of tadpole larva isn't it so examples include bufo or toad rana or frog hyla tree frog salamandra salamander ichthyophis is a worm like creature it looks more like a worm but it does not have limbs it is actually an amphibian and it is referred to as a limbless amphibian Reptilia is derived from the Latin word repier or reptum, which is to creep and crawl. The skin is dry and non-glandular. This is one of the reasons why they were successful in making their, uh, in invading the land. These were the animals which completely uh, became well adapted to land because they had dry skin. They didn't lose water when they moved on to land, isn't it? And then they have similar teeth and they have an external ear or eardrum. They move on their limbs. They have tail, they have neck in their body and they also have claws and they have lungs and other important terrestrial adaptation. They have bones in their endoskeleton, isn't it? And heart is three chambered but in crocodiles it is four chambered. They are poikilotherms, they cannot regulate their body temperature. Some of them shed their scale in the form of a cast like in the case of snakes and lizards. Their sexes are separate, fertilization happens inside the female body. The females lay eggs which are covered with a hard shell. That's why we call such eggs as cledoic eggs. And then the development is direct because the young one hatches out of the egg. It is not a larval stage. Chelone is turtle, testudo is tortoise, chameleon is tree lizard, calotus is the scientific name of garden lizard, crocodilus is crocodile, alligator is alligator, it's the, the, the name is the same, hemidactylus is the common domestic wall lizard and then you have poisonous snakes like naja that is cobra, bangaris that is great and vipera that is viper. Aves, one of the most important thing is they have a boat shaped streamlined body and they are adapted for uh, flight because they have uh, their uh, four limbs are modified into wings isn't it see 
four limbs are modified into wings they have feathers on their body which makes their body very light they have only oil glands at the base of their tail which are called uropygial glands they don't have sweat glands their bones are fully ossified but they are pneumatic they are hollow and filled with air their mouth is covered by a beak which also helps in cutting through the air and it provides aerodynamic uh, property to their body Digestive tract has additional chambers to store the food called crop and gizzard. Gizzard crop sometimes some birds produce milk from crop like in the case of pigeon and they regurgitate the milk to feed their young one or the hatchlings that are there in the nest. Okay, they have lungs which are supported by air sacs. Air sacs increase the efficiency of respiration and also makes their body lighter so that they can take to the air easily. Heart is completely four chambered. Okay, now similar to mammals, their heart is completely four chambered, they are warm blooded animals, they are able to maintain a constant body temperature, their sexes are separate, that is uh, the male and the female sexes are separate, they do not have copulatory structures except in the case of flightless birds where males have copulatory structures and basically fertilization happens when the cloaca of the male and the female come together and the male transfers the sperm, this is called cloacal opposition and then females lay hard calcareous eggs which are called cledoic eggs with lot of yolk in them so we say that the females are oviparous. So Corvus is crow, Columba is pigeon, Cetacula is parrot, then Struthio is ostrich, Neophron is vulture and Aptinoditis is penguin. Examples are the most important thing in this chapter. Note down all the examples both scientific and common name and ensure that you are 100% thorough with the examples. The last class, the most advanced class in phylum chordata, subphylum vertebrata is class mammalia to which we belong, isn't it? Now we are cosmopolitan, we have adapted to or mammals are found in almost all habitats on this planet. One of the reasons being they have the ability to maintain a constant internal temperature. They are not cold blooded, they are warm blooded, even birds are warm blooded, isn't it? Their skin is glandular, they have oil glands, we have sweat glands on our skin and we also have milk producing mammary glands we have different types of teeth that's why we call our dentition or as heterodont different sets of teeth we have canines to tear the food we have uh, incisors to cut the food we have molars and premolars to grind the food isn't it thecodont because our teeth are lodged in sockets in our jaws that is called thecodont they are not directly attached to the bone in our jaws diphyodont because we develop two sets of teeth in our life okay we have an external ear pinna which is again very unique to us mammals and we are homeothermous like I said we can regulate a constant internal body temperature. We exhibit pulmonary respiration because we possess a pair of muscular lungs and we have a voice box which is called larynx. Now in, it, is, it is important to know that the previous class that is birds they have a special song box which is referred to as the syrinx. So we have a voice box whereas birds have a song box which is referred to as the syrinx and then we have epiglottis which makes Make sure that when we swallow food or water, it doesn't enter into our windpipe. We have a lot of different varieties of exoskeleton. We have a hair, we have fur and we have claws, we have horns and hooves etc and we are having limbs which are adapted to perform a variety of functions. We generally show sexual dimorphism. We, males do have copulatory structures to inseminate the female during coitus. Fertilization happens inside the female reproductive tract. Females are generally viviparous and they may be placentals also. So there are some exceptions to this viviparity. There are animals under class mammalia which lay eggs. These animals are referred to as oviparous for example you have platypus which is ornithorhynchus is the scientific name of the duckbill platypus then you have a variety of examples that you need to remember you have macropus kangaroo tiropus bat camelus camel macaca monkey ratus rat can canis dog phyllis cat elephus elephant equus horse Delphinus is the common dolphin, Balinoptera is the blue whale, one of the largest aquatic mammals and the Panthera tigris is tiger and Panthera leo it should be small t and this should be small l. Panthera tigris is tiger and Panthera leo is lion. 
so with that we complete the animal kingdom now let us do a quick brush up of the next chapter in zoology which is referred to as structural organization in animals so you all know that animals are unicellular or multicellular of course we don't find unicellular animals uh, here they have mentioned that uh, unicellular in the sense the correct word to call them is they exhibit a cellular level of organization or they exhibit a tissue level of organization or an organ level of organization or an organ system level of organization like i just mentioned to you okay so animals exhibit cellular level tissue level or organ level or organ system level now you know that a tissue is a group of cells which have similar structure function and origin and the science which deals with the branch of biology that deals with the study of tissues is called histology we are going to learn about some of the major tissues like epithelial connective muscular and neural tissues epithelial uh, tissue is nothing but uh, a tissue which consists of a single layered or a multi layered cells you know how the cells are present here on top of a basement membrane isn't it now basement membrane is where you have a lot of connective tissue matrix nerve endings and capillaries etc okay there is no direct supply of blood to this that's why we call them as uh, we call them as avascular epithelial tissue does not receive direct supply of blood isn't it and uh, the free cells which may be they may be flat they may be cuboidal they may have cilia they may have finger like projections called microvilli and they are held together with little you can see how the cells are literally in contact with each other they have very little intracellular matrix in between them intercellular matrix in between them okay there are a lot of junctions which can hold the cells together like for example if this is a cell in the epithelial tissue and this is another cell in the epithelial tissue so you have certain junctions called tight junctions which seal off the space between the two cells so that there is no leakage of such uh, substances and then you have a cementing substance in between the cells which is called adherent junction which ensure that there is no mechanical wear and tear the cells are mechanically supported to each other and then there are certain channel like cylindrical uh, proteins which are present which are referred to as gap junctions which help in movement of ions and biomolecules between the cells so what is a simple epithelium a simple epithelium is an epithelium which has only a single layer of cells on its basement membrane correct so it has only a single layer of cells now the squamous epithelium is made up of flattened cells so you have this epithelial layer and then you have these flat cells like this they are bulged in the center because of the centrally located nucleus where do you find these squamous cells in blood vessels in air sacs of lungs even in glomerulus in the baumann's capsule of nephron they function as diffusion boundary in alveolus they help in diffusion of gases isn't it then in the inner wall of the blood vessels do you remember what they are called they are called endothelium yes cuboidal epithelium as the name itself indicates the cells are cube like in nature with a centrally located nucleus correct so in uh, squamous epithelium they were flattened with the bulge center but in cuboidal epithelium they are cube like with a centrally located nucleus and these are commonly found in the ducts and glands of tubular parts of nephrons epithelium of proximal convoluted tubule and these cells in con proximal convoluted tubule if this is a cell a cuboidal cell it has fine finger like projections and that's why this becomes a brush bordered cuboidal cell and this is seen in the case of proximal convoluted tubule it is meant for secretion and absorption there are a lot of other parts in the body where you find the cuboidal epithelium for example you find it in the thyroid gland in the testis in the ovary in the ciliary muscle of your eye ciliary body of your eye in the choroid of the eye the lining of the iris in the membranous labyrinth in the ducts of salivary glands and pancreas isn't it so these are the distribution of uh, cuboidal epithelium columnar epithelium is mostly found in the stomach and the intestine and as you know the cells are very tall and columnar they are broad at their apices and they are very very narrow at their bases and they have a basally located nucleus the function of columnar epithelium is uh secretion and absorption and even in columnar epithelium the columnar cells have finger like projections which are called microvilli and then they are referred to as brush bordered columnar cells which are mostly found in the small intestine okay then ciliated epithelium they have fine hair like structure at their free ends which are called cilia they are found mostly in the bronchial tubes 
that is in the trachea in the nasal passages and in the fallopian tube because they help in transportation of substances in the fallopian tube they help in transporting the egg in the case of trachea they help in transporting mucus that is laden with particulate or dust material isn't it fine so glandular epithelium means a cell which is secreting something it secretes substances like mucus enzymes hormones etc so when a cell is involved in secretion it is called a glandular epithelium there are unicellular glands like for example there are cells which look like a wine glass these are called goblet cells they have a basally located nucleus and here they secrete an alkaline a slimy uh, secretion which is referred to as the mucus so these are referred to as the goblet cells, the mucus cells or the goblet cells. Then if it's a gland which has many, many cells together, say for example, there are many, many pyramidal cells like this and all of these cells are secreting something, then we call such a gland as not a unicellular gland. Here it was one cell that was secreting, here it is many cells that are secreting. So we call them as multicellular glands like in the case of salivary glands. Then we have multicellular glands are further classified into exocrine glands and endocrine glands. Exocrine glands are those which have a duct. They don't pour their secretion directly into the bloodstream whereas endocrine glands are those which pour their secretion directly into the bloodstream. They do not have ducts. Then coming to compound epithelium where there are multiple layers. Now why should an epithelium have say for example it has a basal layer like this. Basically, the names are given based on the superficial layer. So as you go up, you can see how the cells are becoming flat and flat and flat. So this is what is referred to as a compound epithelium. See, there are so many layers of cells here. That's why it is referred to as a compound epithelium or a stratified epithelium. It's mostly to protect from mechanical and chemical stressors and it is used in absorption of water and products of digestion. It may be used in kidney. There are in kidney, in the ducts also you have compound epithelium. Okay. So basically you have this one gives you the functions of what is called as the different types of epithelium. So it is usually found in the underlying tissues of uh, the skin. It helps in prevent protecting you from damage. It helps in absorption of water like in the ducts of kidney like proximal convoluted tubule, distal convoluted tubule etc. Now they have only given one example here of this compound epithelium. This can be called as stratified because the uppermost layer of cells are flat isn't it so we call them as the stratified squamous epithelium now this stratified squamous epithelium is of two types there is moist stratified squamous and there is dry a very loose term to use but you must be aware moist means it is non keratinized the cells are not impregnated with a protein called keratin and dry means they are made very very durable because they are impregnated with a protein called keratin now the dry is where you find on your skin the skin is very durable and it is waterproof because of this compare the surface of your skin with the surface of the inside of your mouth that's where you have moist the cells of the superficial layer are not heavily deposited with keratin so we call them as non keratinized or non corrosive Cornified, keratinized or cornified both of them are stratified squamous cells connective tissue they are basically helping in linking and supporting other tissues in the system like for example they connect bone to bone they connect muscle to bone etc and they are, these cells of connective tissue basically have, uh, I mean generally you have inner connective tissue, in any connective tissue that you take there will be a background substance, you will, this is called the ground substance, it is jelly like and in this such substance you will find fibers occurring in tufts or occurring in singles and then you will find these special cells uh, which are involved in secreting these fibers, now these cells which secrete these fibers are called fibroblasts. You will see additional cells which we will discuss later. So basically there is a matrix which is called the ground substance and then you have the fibers, two types of fibers, collagen fibers and elastin fibers and then you have cells in any connective tissue that you consider. Loose connective tissue means, why is it called loose connective tissue? That means there are less fibers. 
or it is less dense there's a lot of flexibility and lot of pliability and it is very very flexible and elastic and that's why it is called loose connective tissue areolar connective tissue is the uh, most common form of connective tissue present beneath the skin it has cells called fibroblasts macrophages mast cells macrophages are phagocytic in nature mast cells secrete histamine and heparin in response to allergic reaction and then it has fibers like i mentioned previously collagen fibers and elastin fibers so you can see how this network of areolar connective tissue looks like isn't it so you can see these bundles these are referred to as the uh, these pink colored bundles are nothing but the collagen fibers and these single fibers that you see are elastin fibers collagen fibers offer tensile strength and rigidity to the tissue whereas elastin fibers offer a lot of flexibility to the tissue in between you can find these allergy uh sensitive cells which are called mast cells and you have cells which secrete these fibers called fibroblasts and then you have collagen fibers it's named as reticular fibers but actually they are uh, the collagen fibers okay then you have fat underneath the skin and around internal organs and that is basically the adipose tissue which helps in packaging your internal organs and also provides protects your internal organs from mechanical damage it provides a cushioning effect then we have loose connective tissue after that we have to learn about dense connective tissue that means there are lot of fibers in dense connective tissue if all the fibers are arranged in a regular pattern then we call it as dense regular if all the fibers fibers are arranged in a haphazard pattern then we refer to it as dense irregular dense regular example is tendon and ligament tendon connects muscle to bone ligament connects bone to bone and dense irregular connective tissue where you have irregularly or haphazardly arranged collagen fibers you find them around the protective coverings of your kidney your adrenal gland your liver that is the glissens capsule in your skin in your submucosa of your intestine in the outer surface of your cartilage and bone etc so then moving on to specialized connective tissue when we talk about special connective tissue we talk about bone cartilage and blood okay so that comes under skeletal tissue now cartilage is something that is present Uh, you know the difference between the cartilage for example in your external ear and the bones bones are very very sturdy you cannot bend them they are not pliable but cartilage is pliable it's found in the tip of your nose in the ear penna between the adjacent long bones of your vertebral column it's found in the rings of the trachea in the larynx etc bones are very hard and pliable they are present only in vertebrates okay and in the bone you have these special cells which are called as osteocytes the cells are present in uh, spaces which are referred to as lacunae so here you can see how a mammalian bone you can see how it is arranged the bone is deposited in the form of these circular units called haversian canals each haversian sorry haversian system in the center of the haversian system you have the haversian canal and if you were to look here this is a haversian system if you were to look into the haversian system you will see that there are spaces in them which are called lacunae if this is the lacunae then you find this bone cell sitting inside the lacunae and the lacunae gives out tube like projections which are called canaliculi and into the canaliculi extend the fallopodia which are membranous projections of the osteocyte because they want to communicate with the osteocytes of the neighboring lacunae so how are these bone cells present they are present in the form of you can see here in the form of concentric layers this is how compact bone is organized in the case of mammals so now moving on to muscle tissue muscle tissue the most important function of muscle tissue is it has contractibility it has response to stimuli isn't it and it also can relax in a coordinated fashion it plays a very important role in movements of the body parts and muscle tissue can be classified into skeletal muscle into smooth muscle as well as into cardiac muscle now skeletal muscle as you all know the muscles are arranged in parallel bundles called muscle fascicles and these skeletal muscles are voluntary in function and you must be aware that if you take a skeletal muscle fiber it is fiber is nothing but a muscle cell it is cylindrical in nature and then it has multiple nuclei which are located peripherally and it is called striated muscle because all throughout the cytoplasm of the skeletal muscle you can see these dark light dark light striations so these are the dark in between you have light dark 
light, dark, light, dark, light, striations. So cylindrical with multinucleate structures are seen in skeletal muscles. Smooth muscles are very different. They have a spindle-like structure. They have tapering ends. They have a centrally located nucleus. They do have actin and myosin, but the actin and myosin is not organized in a regular pattern to produce striations. And that's why they are called unstriated muscle. Most of these skeletal muscles which we discussed are attached to the bone. That's why they are called skeletal muscles. Whereas smooth muscles are found in the visceral organs like your digestive system, the uterus, the oviduct, the iris, the diaphragm, below your lungs, etc. Cardiac muscle fibers are also cylindrical but they are branched. They also have a striated pattern but they are not multinucleated, they are uninucleated. And one cardiac muscle cell from, uh, communicates with another cardiac cell cardiac muscle fiber with the help of these intercalary say for example this is a cardiac muscle cell so this is a branched pattern like this so this is one cardiac muscle cell this is the second cardiac muscle cell okay now this has one nucleus this has the second nucleus in between the two you can see these disc like structures now these disc like structures are called the intercalary discs okay and these are the ones which help in communication between this muscle cell and this muscle cell why should one cardiac muscle fiber communicate with the next cardiac muscle fiber suppose this cardiac muscle fiber receives a signal or a stimulus it starts undergoing contraction it gets excited this excitation must immediately be passed on to the next cardiac muscle also otherwise your heart muscles will not contract and relax in a rhythmic manner if one of them gets excited all the others need to receive that excitation and that happens because of these intercalary sorry it is intercalated discs which is referred to as the communication junction Neural tissue, you all are aware, you have nerves and neuroglia. The supporting cells are referred to as the neuroglia, whereas the structural and the functional units of neural system are referred to as the neuron or the nerve cells. Okay, These are the actual excitable cells. They have a cell body. They have the antennae called dendrites which pick up the stimuli and they have the conducting system which conducts the signal to the next neuron which is called axon. Okay. And basically there is transmission of nerve impulses when a neuron undergoes an electrical disturbance it is said to generate an electric uh, voltage it is said to generate a voltage of plus 30 millivolt and this voltage that is generated along the axon of a neuron when it is excited it is referred to as the nerve impulse the technical term for the nerve impulse is the action potential So you can see how these are the antennae which pick up the signal these smaller branches are called the dendrites and this is the cell body where you have the nucleus and there are certain granules which are present in the nucleus you all know them as the nissel's body isn't it the nissel body which have which are rich in ribosomes and uh, they're actively involved in pro protein synthesis and then you have a cone like portion which is called the axon hillock and then you have this unbranched cylindrical portion which is called the axon and you all are aware how the axon branches into finer branches and it sends signals to the next it ends in these bulb like structure which are referred to as the synaptic bulb so the synaptic button and then you have another neuron over here and this neuron has dendrites in contact with these synaptic buttons and these are the ones which pick up the signal and the same cycle is repeated again it passes through if this neuron has an axon of its own again it reaches the axon terminal of that neuron and this physiological junction between one neuron and the other is referred to as the synapse correct now coming to cockroach let us just do a very quick review of what we had discussed in a cockroach what you all can remember it belongs to phylum orthropoda the two common species in india are periplaneta americana and blata orientalis okay they live in warm dark and damp places they are nocturnal morphology of cockroach you all are aware so basically it has a head with a pair of compound eye and then it has a triangular shield like structure isn't it and then on one side it has a larger wing you cannot see what's inside and then there is a second uh, thoracic segment there's a third thoracic segment 
and then there is abdomen with 10 segments totally and so this segment this large triangular shield which is covering the body the neck of the cockroach is referred to as so this is the head and then the head has a pair of antennae and a pair of compound eyes and this structure which is referred to as the pronotum it is a shield which covers the neck region and it is made up of chitin isn't it and then it is covering the first thoracic segment so inside you have the first thoracic segment this is the second thoracic segment this is the third thoracic segment the second thoracic segment is attached to a wing which is called the fore wing and the third thoracic segment is attached to another wing which is called the hind wing so the second thoracic segment is called the mesothorax the third thoracic segment is called the metathorax this wing which is the fore wing is not functional as in it doesn't help in flight it only protects the hind wing it is called the tegmina and this is the actual part of the wing the hind wing which is attached to the third thoracic segment which is membranous which helps in flight correct and then you can see there are 10 abdominal segments in the cockroach and specifically the last the 10th abdominal segment is forked like this and attached to the 10th abdominal segment is a multiple a jointed filament which is referred to as which is common to both male and female which is referred to as the anal sulcus okay another thing about the body of cockroach is the body of cockroach is consisting it's covered on the outside by numerous chitinous exoskeletal plates and these chitinous exoskeletal plates are called the sclerites okay on the back now for example if this is the cockroach you're looking at the cockroach from the side this is the mouth head and see the neck is also here see, did you notice that the head is at right angles to the longitudinal axis of the body isn't it now on the body of cockroach the exoskeleton this is the skin of the cockroach if you imagine outside the skin of the cockroach you will find these plates exoskeletal plates so you will find these plates which are arranged on the outside that means these the cuticle or these exoskeletal plates is not a continuous layer it is made up of individual plates which are fitted into one another the dorsal plate on the upper surface of the cockroach is called a tergite the ventral plate on the lower surface is called a sternite and how are they united to each other they are connected together by a delicate membrane why why should they be connected so that to offer some amount of flexibility this delicate membrane that covers that connects the tergites adjacent tergites is referred to as the arthrodial membrane So this is the organization of exoskeleton of cockroach. The chitinous layer, the chitinous exoskeleton is not a continuous layer but it is made up of individual plates. The dorsal plates are called tergites and the ventral plates are referred to as sternites. And like we saw in the head, it is formed by the fusion of six embryonic segments and then the head has a pair of compound eye, a pair of fenestra which may be reduced form of simple eye which is sensitive to light. Then there are a pair of filamentous antennae which help in monitoring the surrounding environment so you have this is the compound eye of the head and in front of the compound eye you have the antenna the antenna is a filamentous structure which helps in monitoring the surrounding environment and what is the uniqueness of the eye of the cockroach the unique feature of if this is the head again and if this is the eye of the cockroach the eye of the cockroach is composed of these fine hexagonal units and these hexagonal units are referred to as omatidia or ocelli each cockroach eye has 200 sorry 2000 such hexagonal units which is referred to as omatidia that's why we call the eye of cockroach as a compound eye whereas these hexagonal units are referred to as the simple eye or omatidia okay now coming to the mouth parts now again for the mouth part you have to look at the cockroach the head of the cockroach this is the neck and this is the body you're looking at it from the side so this is the eye the cockroach is seeing in the front here isn't it so you have a mouth part the upper lip which is called the labrum behind the labrum there is mandible and behind that you have 
the maxilla and then you have the labium how do you know which is the maxilla and which is the labium maxilla will have a five segmented maxillary palp and labium will have a three segmented labial palp so this is the upper lip or the labrum now labrum is only one whereas the mandible which i spoke of is two you're looking at the side so one on this side one on the other side the maxillae is also two in number one on this side one on the other side whereas the labium or the lower lip is only one in number okay now in the abdomen the difference between the male and the female abdomen is if you're looking at the abdomen of a cockroach say for example this is the abdomen you're looking at it from the side in case of female what happens is so let me try and simplify it for you i told you that there are plates on the upper surface of the abdomen so this is the plate number uh, 9 and this is the plate number 10 on the upper surface segment this is the plate the tergite of the uh, ninth segment this is the tergite of the 10 segment i told you that the tergite of the 10 segment has a multi-jointed structure which is referred to as the anal circus now in case of female what happens is there is a huge boat shaped plate which is present on the ventral side this boat shaped plate is the seventh sternum then you may ask me a question on top we were discussing about the 8th tergite and the ninth tergite then what about the 8th and the ninth sternite here the 8th and the ninth sternite are hidden inside the 7th sternite and they form a chamber and this chamber is referred to as the genital chamber into which there is the opening of the female reproductive system so remember in case of female cockroaches remember you're looking at it from the side you're looking at the tip of the abdomen this is the back of the cockroach or the dorsal side this is the lower belly side or the ventral side so you have these chitinous plates which are present on the dorsal side eight and nine are normally found but in female cockroaches the plate that you see corresponding to the eighth and the ninth above is not the eighth and the ninth sternum it is a bow shaped sternum that is referred to as the seventh sternum the eighth and the ninth sternum are within the seventh sternum enclosing a space which is referred to as the genital space but what about in male in male if you look at the tip of the abdomen you will find the eighth tergum then uh, sorry the ninth the eighth tergum i'm so sorry this was the ninth tergum and this was the tenth tergum the 10th sternum is missing. You can only see this is the 7th sternum and hidden inside you have the 8th sternum and you have the 9th sternum. 10th sternum is absent in both male and female cockroaches. So again, I'm showing you here. This is the 9th tergum. This is the 10th tergum and it is always the 10th tergum of the cockroach which basically has the anal cerci attached to it. And on the lower surface in males, you have the 8th sternum and you have the ninth sternum i already told you that you have only sternum up to the eighth and the ninth segment the tenth segment the tenth sternum is missing attached to the ninth sternum is a pair of needle like structures which are found only in the male cockroaches which are referred to as the anal style okay now and ventrally so here you will somewhere find the opening of the male reproductive system and on the dorsal side you will find the opening of the anus so remember we are looking at the abdominal end and this needle like a small filament that is emerging from the ninth what this is the ventral side this is the dorsal side so these are the tergites these are the sternites this is referred to as the anal style all right then you know the parts of the digestive system there is uh, mouth there is pharynx there is esophagus there is crop and gizzard now gizzard is something very important because here is where the churning and the grinding of food happens correct and in between in uh, in the front of the esophagus there is a narrow tube that is referred to as the pharynx the pharynx leads into esophagus and then we saw that there is a huge chamber so if this is the pharynx the pharynx esophagus opens into so this portion is the pharynx and then esophagus and then you know that there is a pouch called the crop and then there is a gizzard and at the junction of the gizzard and the midgut you have these six to eight blind ending tube like structures which are called as hepatic ck isn't it 
and then you have a very small portion called mesenteron and midgut and then you have 100 to 150 what thread like yellow colored malpighian tubules and then you have the ileum the colon and lastly you have the rectum which opens out through the anus so i hope you remember the parts of the digestive system of the cockroach circulatory system if you remember if this is the body of the cockroach we had learned that the circulatory system consists of these funnel like structures and these funnel like structures how many such funnel like structures are present these funnel like structures are the chambers of the heart a total of 13 funnel like structures are joined end to end so basically we say that the cockroach has a 13 chambered heart on both sides of the heart you can see these triangular wing like muscles which are called the alary muscles isn't it now each funnel has a narrow neck and a broader base the broader base of the funnel is fitted into the narrow neck of the next funnel and in between there are openings for the blood to enter the heart these openings are called the ostia through the ostia the blood enters from the surrounding space notice there are no blood vessels blood is freely flowing in the space around the heart what is this space the coelom in which the blood is freely flowing it is referred to as the hemoseal so it flows freely in the hemocelic channels. Now this is the pass. Uh, this is the pathway of the passage passage of the blood in cockroach. So in cockroach, again, I'm showing you the sideward view. So you have this is the head. You have two membranes which divide the body into three compartments. This is a membrane with openings in between which is called the ventral diaphragm and there is a membrane on top with openings in between called the dorsal diaphragm okay now this space is called the perineural sinus this is called the perivisceral sinus this is called the pericardial sinus heart is over here so let me show a small tube over here so blood comes out of the heart it passes through all the chambers it enters the space in the head and then it passes into the lower chamber first which is called the perineural sinus and then it passes through these openings into the perivisceral sinus and then it passes into the pericardial sinus and through the ostia it enters back into the heart so this is the pathway of circulation in cockroach respiratory system includes trachea they have 10 pairs of trachea two in the thoracic region and remaining eight in the abdominal region the trachea branch out into fine tubes which enter individual cells which deliver oxygen to individual cells these fine tubes delivering oxygen are called the tracheoles So during inspiration mechanism of respiration it's very important that the tracheoles which are the fine tubes which make their way into the cells they are the ones which are provided with lot of fluid in them the fluid will help in transporting the oxygen into the cells similarly the fluid also takes up carbon dioxide from the cells and the carbon dioxide is let out of the spiracle okay excretory system we had learned 100 to 150 yellow colored thread like structures which are called malpighian tubules and then there are uh, the malpighian tubules are provided with glandular and ciliated cells please remember cockroach eliminates uric acid as its nitrogenous waste it is referred to as uricotelic the nervous system in case of cockroach is present around the esophagus that's why we call it a circumesophageal ganglia a pair of brain a pair of ganglia called cerebral ganglia which is similar to the brain a poorly developed brain is present above the esophagus that's why it is called supraesophageal ganglia okay so now imagine this is the nervous system it is a hollow tube like this so it is through this uh, th these two swollen structures above which I'm shading here these are the supra esophagus and this is the canal through which the esophagus passes okay 
and then you have the crop and the gizzard and all that isn't it so esophagus is surrounded by the brain these two structures are called supraesophageal because they are present above the esophagus and this is called subesophageal ganglia it's two fused into one and because it is present below the esophagus it is called subesophageal ganglia and then you have at regular intervals you have paired nerve cords and then you have ganglia present in each segment of the body there are totally three ganglia that are located in the thorax one of them is present in the prothorax the first thoracic segment one in the second thoracic segment one in the third thoracic segment and totally the double ventral nerve cord has a total of six ganglia in the abdomen so six ganglia in the abdomen plus three seven eight nine totally there are nine ganglia in the body of the uh, cockroach okay three in the thoracic region and six in the abdominal region and like we saw how are the ganglia united together they united together by these paired double ventral nerve cord and where does the gang uh, the nerve cord originate from from a ganglia called sub esophageal ganglia present below the esophagus and you can see how a ring is connecting the upper ganglia with the lower ganglia and this ring is called the circum because it goes around the esophagus isn't it that's why it is called the circum esophageal connective and these two swollen structures which i have shaded over here these are the ones which are actual the actual parts of the brain which are called the supra esophageal ganglia then moving on to the reproductive system the male reproductive system and the female reproductive system now the male reproductive system has if you remember the male reproductive system there are three lobe testes present between the segments 4 5 and 6 of the abdomen and from each of them a vast difference comes it loops behind and then it joins a mushroom shaped gland which have longer tubules yes mushroom shaped gland is present somewhere between the 6th to the 7th abdominal segment and then there are smaller tubules here and then it joins the vast difference joins and it continues down as a broad muscular tube called is uh, called ejaculatory duct which opens out to the male genital aperture then behind the mushroom shaped gland there is another gland whose duct you can see passing here and opening very close to the male genital and this gland that is present behind the mushroom shaped gland is referred to as the phallic or the conglobate gland okay so very very simple i have uh, uh, cut short the explanation so you have to open the textbook go through the diagram and you will be able to recall that there are these longer tubes which are called utriculi majoris there are shorter tubes called utriculi brevioris and then there is two openings the opening of the ejaculatory duct and the opening of the phallic duct And then I showed you that uh, uh, the vast difference from the testis comes up like this. It loops behind like this. It goes behind. And then I told you that there is a mushroom shaped gland. The mushroom shaped gland, it looks almost like a sunflower here in this diagram. It has longer tubes. The longer tubes are what I'm showing you right now. Correct. And it has shorter tubes over here. And then it continues as the vast difference actually opens into this muscular tube called the ejaculatory duct and this mushroom shaped gland is present at the junction of the vast difference and the ejaculatory duct and then you have to see behind these smaller tubes you can also find another on the ventral side of the ejaculatory duct you can find certain tubes which are referred to as the seminal vesicle it is in the seminal vesicle that the sperms are bundled up together to form clusters called spermatophores okay female reproductive system it consists of a pair of ovaries isn't it and which open into so basically the ovary is made up of 
these individual tubules what are these individual tubules these are referred to as ovarian tubules or ovarioles there are eight per ovary so i have shown you here one two three four five and behind you can see six seven eight so these tubes are referred to as the ovarioles the eggs are released by the ovarioles and the eggs come down through this oviduct so this is the oviduct and the two oviducts unite together to form a common oviduct which is called the vagina which opens out through the female genital aperture and the ovary extends between the second to the sixth abdominal segment okay second to the sixth abdominal segment is where like we saw in the testis it was the fourth to the sixth abdominal segments in case of uh, the female reproductive system of cockroach it is the second to the sixth abdominal segment and once the female undergoes uh, fertilization, once the male sperm are transferred into the female reproductive system, the female produces the egg cases, about 9 to 10 of them. Each egg case contains about 14 to 15 eggs in them. The development is porometabolis. Porometabolis means the young one is a miniature form of the adult. Okay, And the young one which resembles the adult except that it doesn't have the wings and it is sexually immature is referred to as the nymph. It undergoes 13 times molting in order to become the adult. Okay, So this was the um, a quick summary of two major chapters animal kingdom and structural organizations. So until next time uh, all of you take care and happy studying for your NEET examination.